Hi, this is Royce Freeman, and welcome to TTFT, and I'm here with... Robert Meyer Burnett. So uh, give us a little, um, like, a backstory. Um, how did you get into film? Well, you know, it's funny. When I was a little kid, uh, my favorite movie when I was five years old was War of the Worlds, Byron Haskins' War of the Worlds from 1953. And I just became obsessed with, with movies. And, you know, I watched a lot of them. I was, I was of course, I loved classic Star Trek. I loved the original Twilight Zone. I loved Outer Limits. I didn't watch a lot of what normal kids would watch, I guess. And where I grew up in Seattle, there was sci-fi theater, which was on two o'clock on Sunday afternoon. So I'd come home from Sunday school and watch these, these science fiction movies or genre films, Godzilla films, uh, sometimes bad, sometimes great. But I was just obsessed with movie making. But it really wasn't until Star Wars came out when they really started to feature, there was a great documentary on how Star Wars was made, and I started really reading film magazines like Cinefantastique and Starlog, and I got really interested in, in filmmaking. And then at the same time, well, a little after that, home video exploded. And in 1980, I actually ended up working at a video store when I was 13, uh, a video store called Video Space in, in um Seattle and Bellevue, Washington, and it was generally considered the second video store in the United States. And at 13, I started to get really serious about wanting to make movies and having access to films whenever you wanted them really turned me into this voracious film junkie. I, I couldn't get enough. And, and suddenly I could see movies from all over the world and you could watch movies at will. You didn't have to scour the TV guide to see what was on late night. And then I really started reading books about the great masters. I remember getting um, Truffaut's book where he interviews Hitchcock, and I must have read that book a hundred times. And I really just started, and you know, it was kind of a combination of things with Spielberg and Lucas, the rise of, of blockbuster films. And then they had TV shows like That Center, or That's Hollywood, it was That's Hollywood. And uh, I think Tom Bosley narrated it. And it was about the history of Hollywood. and it became a thing. So it was a confluence of stuff. It was cable television, working in a video store, post Spielberg and Lucas, and then all the movies that followed in their wake. And uh, also I lived in Seattle. So there was an incredible international film festival, which still exists today. And I started going when I was 12. And I would watch anything and everything from all over the world. And that's all I ever wanted to do. And then when I went to college, uh, at the Evergreen State College in Washington State, they had 16 millimeter film equipment. So you could just check out a, six, a really 16 millimeter, a really great 16 millimeter film camera and um, go make, go shoot 16 millimeter footage. And it was, it was, uh, that's where it just started. And suddenly I took off from there. Uh, and then I transferred to USC. And about two weeks after leaving uh, film school at USC, I got my first job in the industry, which was I knew a woman who called me and she said, would you like to come work on Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3? <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding? And so I was the art department production assistant. And uh, what was pretty neat about that was it was a new line cinema movie and they were going to, they, they hoped that Leatherface would be, um, would, would be, would follow up with the success they'd had on the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. So one of my first jobs uh, on Leatherface was to go to the set of Nightmare on Elm Street 5 and watch some of the effect sequences being shot. And when they were done, just take whatever I could take that we might be able to use for Leatherface. And uh, suddenly I, I spent the summer of 1989. It was 20-hour days, six days a week, but I loved every second of it. And there I was on set of a horror film. I, I, I couldn't believe it. And from then on, it was just I had a, all kinds of different jobs. And and uh, as one does, you you do whatever comes your way. And right after that movie was over, I was lucky to get a job working for the senior vice president of physical production at Warner Brothers, uh, Bill Young, who started a new program from he called the Management Trainees where they wanted to train young people that could work within the studio system. And um, it uh, it was fantastic. I mean, being I, I, there I was, 22 years old, 
and I was working on a mo- I was working on this Warner Brothers lot. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. <laughs> that was man, that was those are good days. <laughs> so, what was it like um, working on the set uh, with K and B and meeting Ken Foray, perhaps, and just the, the environment oh. on Leatherface? Man, you've done your research. Um, you know, at first, it's it, it was scary because you don't know what... I'd never worked on a film before. I'd never been on a set before. And I didn't really know what to do. And the funny thing was, the first day that I was there, I had I had the, the, the pick of the litter. There was a Ford Dooley pickup truck or a Ford Econoline van. And what I didn't realize is that a lot of the time they would just buy these vehicles for the art department and it was it was understood that they would get beat to hell because we were shooting in the mountains behind Magic Mountain and we were also building a set outdoors in Palmdale. So my first day on the job, I was handed $10,000 in a list and they said, don't come back until you get everything on this list. <laughs> and this is like 7.15 a.m. and it was paint and lumber and and I kind of had, they sent me to this like grocery store supply place and where like where you get hang slabs of, of meat, of beef. And like they had things like the hanging, the hanging like a silver metal box that had a red button and a green button in it. And I, I they're like, buy what you think could go on the set. So I had like some creative leeway. So I was able to, I figured, yeah, well, if they got hanging bodies, you know, human bodies, they might have just what they had in the grocery store, a slaughterhouse or something for these big sides of meat. So I bought a bunch of that stuff. And then one of the things on the, on the list was don't mess with Texas bumper stickers. And I'm like, where am I going to get those? I'm in California. And then I thought, and I wasn't going to ask either because this was a test. And I figured, you know, maybe a truck stop would have them. And so I looked up and back then there was no internet, you know, you had to use a Thomas guide. And I, I, I drove out to this truck stop. I'd never been to a truck stop in my life. And I mean, it was a real 18 wheeler truck stop with a gift shop and you could rooms and you could get a shower and stay overnight or whatever. And in the gift shop, they had like three different kinds of don't mess with Texas bumper stickers. So I just bought them all. And so I come back at the end of the day and I didn't get back till almost seven o'clock. And Mick Strawn, the production designer, uh, looks at me, you know, I have all my stuff. And he goes, did you get the Don't Mess With Texas bumper stickers? I said, yes, sir. And I, I got three different kinds so you could choose. And he looks at me and he goes, you can come back tomorrow. <laughs> so that was, um, that was, and and then, of course, Ken Foray uh, starred in Dawn of the Dead, which is one of my favorite horror films of all time, fa- favorite films of all time, the original Romero version. And... You know, it's one of those things where I'd never met an actor, especially an actor that I I loved. I mean, I'd seen Dawn of the Dead. It was, I, I had the bootleg videotape before it was officially released by Thorny M.I. And I, I knew this movie like the back of my hand. I'd shown it to my friends a hundred times. And so I kind of thought, I think the way a lot of people do, that a movie, a, a guy who's in a movie uh, that you love must know how much you love it. Like actors must have the same experience, if not more, if they're in a movie that we as fans watching a movie have. And so I figured there's going to be this time where I'm going to sit down, like uh, there's going to be an opportunity where I'm going to get to talk to Ken Foray and I'm going to show him, I'm going to run lines from Dawn of the Dead with him. And uh, he's going to regale me with stories about Dawn of the Dead. And he's going to realize that I am part of the tribe, that I understand you know, and because and, that's what I figured if, if, if you're in a movie like that, you must get up in the morning and just think about the movie all the time and how great it was to make it. Now, keep in mind, this is like, you know, 10 years later. It's a full decade later. And one day we we're shooting outside at this farmhouse set that the art department had built. And everybody ate lunch on the picnic tables outside of the farmhouse that we put there. And he sits right next to me at lunch. <laughs> and I'm like, this is the moment, man. This is what I'm going to do. It. I'm going to prove to him that I'm the biggest Dawn of the Dead fan he's ever going to meet. And I'm trying to be all cool. I turned to him and I said, you know, Mr. Foray, my name is, is Rob Burnett. I'm, I'm on the art department. And I just want to say I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the work you did with 
the great indie filmmaker George Romero, specifically Night Riders and, of course, Dawn of the Dead. You know, I'm trying to be like, I can't even imagine what I must have sounded like. And and he turns like, yeah, man, that was that was great. I, I, the movie was so much fun to work on. And I just remember it was really cold in that mall. And then he turned and started eating his lunch. And I'm like, that, that that's it? Like, I didn't know. I wanted to continue the conversation. But then I realized, you know, he wasn't shining me on or anything. It's just that that was 10 years ago for him. And his he made that movie and moved on. And he'd worked on a lot of a lot of other films. And his mind was on the work at hand and what he had to do for the rest of the day. And and that made me realize that, okay, uh, just because he was in this movie, his experience of the movie was in making it and dealing with the logistics of what it's like to be on set and be an actor and dealing with guns and motorcycles and all the kinds of things that you have to deal with when you're an actor in a movie like that. And he, his experience was not watching the film. So the storyline and the characters and all that, he, he didn't sit at home and watch Dawn of the Dead all day. <laughs> you know, So that was actually a very important lesson for me that served me well later in life. Because, well, I, you know, being seeing meeting other actors and then also working with my childhood idol, William Shatner, if I had gone into that relationship with Shatner as the bouncing, bubbly fanboy, it never would have worked. How did uh, the uh, experience working on um, the set of Leatherface lead to uh, working on the set of Army of Darkness? Well, what's interesting, so I had worked on Leatherface and then I worked at Warner Brothers for a couple of years. And when I was working at Warner Brothers, um, it was all about physical production. So you saw at the studio level how the logistics of massive, like I, I worked at Warner Brothers when Bonfire of the Vanities was made. And there, there's a whole book written on that production, The Devil's Candy. And I, because it kind of exploded and ran away, it was a runaway production. And it wasn't the studio's fault, it was the fact that Brian De Palma and Fred Caruso, the producer, could get whatever they want. And when our our uh, section, when the feature production wanted to say, look, you can't spend $100,000 getting one shot of an Air France Concorde landing. You have to figure out something else. Well, they would just call the heads of the studio, Bob Daly and Terry Semmel, and say, uh, we need this shot. And Bob Daly and Terry Semmel would be like, oh, okay. So what physical production tried to curtail the costs they were always overridden and it was incredibly frustrating for my bosses to watch, but it was fascinating for me. So that job was a finite job. And after we were done, we were supposed to go somewhere else, pick somewhere else to, to work. And I went to work for Joel Silver's office, who I was a, a reader, a story analyst. And it really wasn't really a good fit. It was like having homework every day and it was brutal. And I was there for about six months and I, it just wasn't a good fit for me. And then a friend of mine called me and said, Hey man, I'm a, I'm a coordinator now at Tony Gardner's Altarian Studios, which I had known. It was, a, it was a special effects makeup house. It's still around today. Tony Gardner's still working today. And they had just finished working on Dark Man, Sam Raimi's Dark Man. And he called me up and he said, I need good people to come work for me. And you'd be basically like a production assistant, but an assistant coordinator because you know, you know what production needs. And so... When I worked there, this though I was working, I worked on a a movie that Gail Ann Hurd produced called Cast a Deadly Spell, which was Fred Ward played H.P. Lovecraft, the detective, and in, in a noir setting in like '40s Los Angeles. But there were magic users, and it, it was it was a fun fun movie. I, I want to say it was the HBO movie. It might have been a Showtime movie, but it was really cool because we were building this giant Cthulhu like affect this demon and then I just ended up staying there and I worked on the Swamp Thing TV series and I worked on uh, Mick Garris's movie Sleepwalkers which was the first original screenplay that uh, Stephen King wrote and then we were also working on Army of Darkness so we were working on like three or four projects at the same time and like for Sleepwalkers what would happen is we would make all the latex appliances and things that were, and we had the, the cat. We they had there were these cat creatures, like cat werewolves or were cats, I guess. And um, so, what I would do is part of my job was I had to take all the appliances, the latex appliances that were sculpted and baked 
for every day. And I would have to take them from our, our, our office, well, our whole facility and take them to the set. And then, which was, you know, in and around Los Angeles. And then also wherever they were shooting army of darkness, like up in Acton where they built the castle or an intro vision, which was, um, next to the, um, Warner studios lot in Ho- Hollywood, not in, in Burbank. Uh, now it's just called the lot. Um, and then I would have to go, like, I'd have to paint Dick Duroc's face appliances for Swamp Thing. So it was, I was doing a bunch of different stuff, but I was in and off, on and off sets, and I was talking to line producers or coordinators because I could speak their language, and I could find out, I'm like, okay, so what do we need for the week? And uh, at the same time, it was really interesting, Fred Caruso, who produced Bonfire of the Vanities, was working for Roland Joffe's company, Light Motive, and they were making Super Mario Brothers, the movie. And it's so funny to talk about this now, but this was the movie that, I want to say it was Greg Champion, or he directed Mom and Dad Save the World, and they were going to make the Super Mario Brothers movie really close to the games. So we were building all these creatures. They were spending millions of dollars at our studio, and we were making like King Koopa and all the all the creatures that looked just like the game. And when mom and dad save the world didn't do very well, they decided to revamp the whole movie. And, uh, they, we got basically let go because they wanted to go in a different direction. And so, uh, that's, that's when I left, I left working at that studio because usually they just bring people on for each show. And then when the show's over, people leave and go to other makeup effects studios. So the work just, there wasn't any more work. And, um, but so I got to work on the, you know those sets, Army of Darkness and Sleepwalkers and uh, Cast a Deadly Spell. It was great. I mean, it was great because again, I was learning a, another facet of the business, and I was seeing how makeup effects, physical makeup effects, were made, and uh, meeting all the sculptors, and it was it was an incredible education. But it also allowed me to sort of see how do you employ those things. I mean, how do you effectively use special makeup effects and when do you know when to use appliances or a man in a suit or it was fascinating it was something that again i every every place i went i just learned i was soaking up everything like a sponge and it was i mean it was the I, and i was having the best time you know i was now i think i was like 23 24 and i'm working on i'm getting credits so like i have a screen credit on army of darkness which it was incredible. Did you get a chance to work with uh, Bill Mosley or uh, Bruce Campbell? Uh, okay, Bill Mosley, I had met. I mean, I you meet those guys, but I didn't. Uh, you know, you and they would say hello and stuff, and you would interact with them because we would bring. But I wasn't working directly with the actors. I would bring the stuff in to all of our on set guys and sort of leave. Like you couldn't. I could stay and linger if I wanted to, but. You know, it was it was always so busy, and on these movies, there was so much going on that there wasn't really time. And because I was coming and going, I didn't really get to talk to people. I talked to people on Leatherface more, but but not on these other bigger productions because there's just no time. I know that you said you worked at Warner's. Did you um, did you work with um, uh, Dick Donner or any? Well, yeah. Okay, so. I was in, I worked on Free Willy, <laughs> which they produced. And it was really interesting because I was in and out of, so at the at Warner Brothers at the time, where the main uh, executive offices were, where we were located, right next to those executive offices were Joel Silver's suites and Dick Donner's suites. And it was kind of like a donut or a, 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 like an oval shaped O. And so in the middle of the O was a walkway that went to, Donner's front doorstep and then to Silver's front doorstep. And then the other parts of the O were where their story departments were and the people that worked PAs were there. And so I was in and out of Donner's offices. That was something I skipped after I, between Silver Pictures and working at Altarian, I worked on Free Willy. I was the producer's assistant for a while. And that was a, so I was in Dick Donner's office every day. And it was cool because I got to talk to him actually quite a bit i i was introduced to him and um one of the guys there was a there was a guy named a producer named harvey bernard who produced um the omen movies and he had known my grandparents 
and he was the producer of Lady Hawk with Dick Donner. And when I was in high school, he called me up one day out of the blue, knowing I was a huge movie fan, and 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 I went and saw Lady Hawk at a special screening, and he he kind of took an interest in me. And the reason I got my job at Warner Brothers is he called me up one day, and he's the one that got me the job. So when I explained that to Dick Donner, he would um, he would just start talking to me. So I talked to him a lot, and it was funny because the fact that I knew that he directed Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, the Twilight Zone episode with William Shatner, he thought that was hilarious because he didn't... These guys don't understand. They didn't... One of the things I, I realized when I worked, when I started working in the business is as a, as a fanatical film fan, they're not used to people in the business. They're, they're not used to dealing with people that know, that could just run off everything they've ever done. So when somebody can do that and, and I would do it, I wouldn't be like, Oh my God, you direct this. Blah, blah, blah. I was professional about it. And, and when the opportunity arose, I would be able to like slip into a conversation like, Hey man, you know, you, you directed that Twilight Zone episode with William Shatner. And he, yes, yes, I did. You know, and you had to do it in a way. I learned quickly how to do it in a way that didn't make me look like a slobbering fanboy. Because if you did it that way, they wouldn't, they, they're they like, oh, good kid. I'm glad you liked it. So you had to figure out a way to speak like you were in the industry. So I, I and I had to tamp that. And sometimes I couldn't do it. Sometimes I totally fanboyed out and people knew. But I tried to keep a lid on it. Um, and also, one of the, when I was on the Warner lot too, because in my off hours, I would just wander around the lot and go meet people or find things and talk to people. And because I worked for Bill Young, I had a credibility. Some Somebody would stop me and go, uh, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from feature production, Bill Young's office. And they're like, oh, okay. So I could literally walk onto any set of any movie that we were making because I was, I had to collect call sheets and production reports. So I would just like, Hmm, what are they shooting today? Gremlins two. Let's go see the set of gremlins two, you know, and I would go and hang out cause they had built this on stage 16, which was a giant set. Uh, they built this shopping mall or when we were shooting Joe versus the volcano stage 16, you could take the floor out and fill it with water. And like I would go stand on the set and watch them film this storm, and you know, you're, suddenly I just found myself standing next to Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks, and they were delightful. They were really nice, and because I was standing there, invariably somebody'd be like, and you know, they would go, "Hey, who are you?" and explain who I was. And because I was from that office, people would talk to me, which was the best thing. Prince, when Prince was in, and I'm a huge Prince fan, was when Prince was in Post on Graffiti Bridge. He had a turquoise Mercedes or turquoise BMW at the time. And he almost backed into me. He didn't, but his driver did. And it was funny when, and I, I, I was on my bike. I didn't realize anyone was in the car and he didn't get out. His driver got out, made sure I was okay. I'm like, I'm fine. I just kind of fell over. I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine. But I'm like, I didn't, I, I, I really wanted to say, can I meet Prince? But I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Cause I did get in trouble. Sometimes I would say, uh, I, I, and it, so they were shooting Rocky five and they were shooting it on one of the streets on the Warner back lot. And it was the street. It's when Tommy Gunn comes out of this bar and they get in this fight and, the, and they were shooting it and it was amazing. So I'm standing on, I was walking past that set where my car was and I was just standing watching and I clearly was not supposed to be there. And if like, I think the first AD asked who I was. And um, I said, oh, I'm with feature, uh, Warner Brothers Feature Production. The next morning, I would get called into Bill's office and Bill would say, uh, if you're ever on the set of a movie that's not a Warner Brothers movie, don't tell them you work for me. Because <laughs> then he would get the phone call and, and that would happen. That would happen a lot. I mean, it would just just because I was I was interested in everything. And, on you know, it was it was incredible. Like uh, in the mill where they built the flats for all the sitcoms and the sets and everything, hanging on the wall was the time machine from Nicholas Meyer's Time After Time. And it was just there. I don't know why it was there on the wall. And it looked just like it did in his movie. And then one day, somebody came and took it off the wall, repainted it, added a bunch of stuff on it. And it had been there for like 10 years. 
hadn't moved in 10 years and somebody used it in a music video and totally ruined it and like the, i knew where the full scale v shuttles were from the v alien miniseries so i could bring people on the lot and i'd be like come here check this out and at that time they had a whole western town still on the warner brothers back lot and i, I used to just wander around and, and i i could get anybody i wanted on the lot so <clears throat> my friends would be like hey you want to have lunch in the commissary <laughs> you never know who you're gonna see <laughs> it was great i just realized that in you know that six degrees of kevin bacon game yeah, you know, I I don't know how many uh, degrees of William Shatner you are, besides working in that one movie you directed. But you took a job working at Water Brothers, and you got to hang out with um, Richard Donner, uh, who directed William Shatner. And then you ended up working on Superman Returns, which was a sequel to a Dick Donner film. Yeah. So it, it, so you you your your career kind of like quantum leap. It kind of the it. it the, the threads kind of touch. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I think the one the if the biggest mistake that I had though was I was too much of a fanboy. I I was doing all these things and I I did a good job and I I really had fun and I was always enthusiastic and people liked me. But what I didn't do, I was still so every day I went to work, I was so enamored of what, what I was doing. I, I couldn't believe it. It was like living in a dream world that I if I had buckled down, like if I had written a screenplay and I was really serious about making movies, I could have had access to anyone. And when I was and I've often regretted, I mean, I was 22 years old working at Warner Brothers. I didn't uh, 22. What was I? I didn't I didn't have that mentality. You know, it wasn't like Steven Spielberg walked on the Universal lot when he was like 20, set himself up in an office. I was too much of a fanboy. And I didn't I didn't think about it as a business because in my mind, I'm just, I'm going to learn as much as I can and I'll go figure it out later. But I had access to everybody. If I had an independent film project that I wanted to shoot like on the weekends, I could have had access to the entirety of Warner Brothers. I could have, I could have got anything I wanted. Um, and I just, I wasn't mature enough and I wasn't focused enough then to know what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, then I stayed in the independent film world after that, which was fun, but it didn't allow me, you know, I didn't propel myself to any great heights and I still had a great, uh, so much fun in my career. Um, but I didn't, you know, I wanted to be a cross between Kubrick Cronenberg and John Carpenter and I um I I sort of missed that opportunity but on the other hand I had a lot of fun so it comes down to it when I when I shuffle off this mortal coil I I had a wonderful time I've had and I'm you know I'm not done yet I still had a I, but I still want to direct more and make more movies there's so much more to do it's just the world our society and the meaning of movies in our society I think has changed a great deal in the 34 years I've been in the business, which is both fortunate and unfortunate. How did you get uh, the the task? Uh, well, not the task, I guess the, how did you come upon uh, re-editing Arcade? So this is a really interesting, this, this is another interesting story. So Full Moon Entertainment was Charlie's band, uh, Charlie's band, Charles Band's company. He had, he had started one of the very first home video companies, Mita Home Entertainment, that later became Media. He also started Wizard Video. I mean, he was a pioneer, and he was in the 80s. He was making movies at his Empire Studios like Reanimator and From Beyond and Dolls, the Stuart Gordon films. And by the 90s, he had his company Full Moon Entertainment. And Full Moon had an output deal with Paramount. And they were basically making a movie a month. They were making the subspecies movies, the doll man movies the demonic toys movies and all kinds of crazy low budget movies they were making for a million bucks and a friend of mine dan schweiger calls me up one day and he goes um i because he'd been working in promotions cutting movie trailers and stuff and he says i've been put in charge of this movie arcade that was deemed unreleasable by paramount and it was a movie like a knockoff of Tron where teenagers and one of them was Peter Billingsley who starred in, in um, 
Christmas Story and Seth Green and Megan Ward and uh, John Delancey, who was Q on Star Trek The Next Generation, was in it. These kids get sucked into this evil video game. But the the stuff in the video game was shot on beta camp, beta videotape, and really just horrible uh, green screen effects. It was really bad. It looked terrible. And the movie was actually edited in about seven days. I mean, it was it was just a mess. And it was it was nigh unwatchable. So Dan's task was he said, look, I am having all these new effects made and I'm overseeing the creation of these new effects. And it was with a company out of Montreal called DHD Post Image. And he said, what I want you to do is we're going to rescan the negative, retell us any the negative, because all these movies were finished on videotape instead of cutting negative. And since these were these were CG effects, rudimentary CG effects, and you know, this was 1993, and we were just supposed to drop the new effects in with the newly transferred negative footage that was going to have a better transfer. And, and I was doing this with Peter Billingsley, so I'd never met Peter, and we worked together. And as we are looking at all this footage, because they transferred all the footage, I said to Peter, I go, you know, there's a lot of footage here that was never used in the original cut of the movie. And Peter was the original assistant editor, which is why he came back. And I said, we could, we could recut this movie and we could make it better. And Peter's like, well, I don't know if we can do that. And I said, look, man, this movie is so bad. We can make this movie much better. So I call up Dan and I said, Dan, what if we recut this movie and we can make it a better movie? And Dan said to me, he goes, what do you know about editing a feature film? And I said, well, because I had been editing little shorts since I was a kid, but I took an editorial course at USC and I got an A in it. And I said, well, I got an A in my editing course at USC. How hard can it be? And so he ran that up the flagpole and Charlie Band said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll give you boys, you can you can show me 10 minutes. I'll, I'll pay for you to be in the edit bay enough. So it was like two weeks you recut the first 10 minutes of the movie. And if I like what I see, I'll let you continue. So we were in there. We barely left. We slept in there and we, we edited this and we were, it was a tape to tape system. It was not nonlinear editing had not penetrated the world at that point. So it was tediously painstaking work and oh, it was horrible, but we finished the first 10 minutes and we turned it in and we took something that was, unwatchable uh to being really really mediocre and i was damn proud of that mediocrity and charlie ben was basically he couldn't believe it he's like you mean this movie could have been this way the whole time and i i was like well the effects still would have been terrible and he goes continue so for the next six months peter and i recut restructured we rewrote and david goyer the same david goyer who went on to make like the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, he wrote this movie. And it was like he'd written two movies for Full Moon. And like because there was a creature, this maniacal video game, we, we rewrote all the monsters dialogue to to help the story along. And we we uh, learned all we needed to know about sound design. And so Peter and I did everything to make I learned everything about post-production uh, working on this film. And when we finished it, it actually was a nom- it was nominated for best independent direct to video release of the year in 1993. Was it finished on video? So that means that there's no um, answer print that exists to that. No, yeah, it was all. So what Full Moon? This this was pretty common in the 90s and 80s. So like for instance, Star Trek: The Next Generation, while the show was shot on 35 millimeter. It was finished on videotape. And so even, even all the uh, effect shots, the model shots of the ships, they were the elements were shot on 35 millimeter, but they were composited on videotape. So unlike the original Star Trek series, there was no negative that existed of Next Generation. So that's why later on in 2012, when I worked on the documentaries of Star Trek for the Blu-rays, they had gone back to the negative and they had restored in 2K all of the Next Generation episodes. And it took three, it actually took four years. Um, but Arcade was the same way. It was shot on 35 millimeter. They telecined that uh, negative to tape 
and it was only ever finished at NTSC resolution. That was true of a lot of TV shows um, of the time and a lot of direct-to-video movies because it cost a lot less than uh, cutting negative. So there's a lot of stuff that, like, unfortunately, like the original Twilight's, not uh, the Twilight Zone, and the 1985 Phil Daguerre, uh, Michael Straczynski produced Twilight Zone was shot that way and it was posted on tape. Uh, same with X Files, and there was a lot of big shows that were done that way. A lot of those shows they they had to spend, they spent like twelve million dollars rescanning all of the negative for Star Trek: The Next Generation, and that's why Deep Space Nine and Voyager only exist in standard definition because no one's taken wanted to pay the time, uh, take the time or pay the money to retransfer those negatives, and that's true of a lot of TV shows, unfortunately. So how did um how did you go from doing the um the, w- the work on uh, arcade and Army of Darkness and and all those projects? How did you end up directing your first feature? Well, after arcade, uh, Peter and I did a lot of. We made a few short films. One of them we sh- sold uh, to this company that put it out as part of a compilation called Midnight Follies, um, which was cool. Then I started specializing in editing first time directors movies and and being their post supervisor because the avid had been introduced and for those of you people who don't know uh, the avid was a um it's a computer based editorial i mean now everyone's editing on a computer but back then lucasfilm had created this thing called an edit droid and there were other there are there's like there was a few other uh, computer-based editing systems, but Avid was the industry standard. And it made it possible for one person to edit a movie. So I learned that system. I was working for a while at an ad agency editing promos, uh, network promos. And I taught myself the Avid. They had an Avid at this company, this ad agency. And they basically, they got one in, they, they gave it to me and they said, learn it. So I learned the Avid and then I I started doing a lot of freelance editorial jobs here and there, cutting trailers and things like that. And then I started getting calls from first-time filmmakers. And I, I literally started cutting entire feature films, most of which no one's ever heard of, and then being the post-supervisor on them and supervising them all the way through their sound mix to their delivery. And so I did that from... I want to say from like 95 to 97 and I might have, I think I did five or six features. And then I was, this, this guy calls me up one day and on my, this is so weird on my answering machine, I've always said, have a better day. And I get a phone call from this producer and the producer hires me. His name was Dan Bates and they had made a movie called the asphalt quartet. And it was a, horrible horrible uh quentin tarantino ripoff because back then everybody was by this time the late 97 i think jackie brown came out in 97 or 98 so reservoir dogs and pulp fiction had come out and everybody was ripping him off and so the asphalt quartet was a a tarantino ripoff and they hired me to do a trailer for it so to cut the trailer, they had the Avid at their edit bay and the Avid had the whole film on it. And I had access, I could see all the dailies, I could see everything. So I cut this trailer and they really liked it. And the guy who produced, who paid for this movie was this guy named Mort Salkind, but he wasn't, he wasn't, um, he, he was kind of like the Jewish Tony Soprano. And he later got arrested or something. I don't know. He, he really was kind of like a, a gangster. And um, he comes any, in. Any relation to the Saul kinds? Yeah, no, no. I, I, no. I asked him that. And he, it wasn't. And he looked at the trailer, and he, he liked my trailer, and he said, "Well, what do you think of the movie?" And I said, "This movie's terrible." <laughs> and and he, they knew it was terrible. So, and I said, "But it could be better." And he goes, "Really?" I said, "Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know, I don't know anything about who edited this movie, but it can be a better movie." And so he goes, I'll tell you what, kid, you know, I'll pay you for two weeks. And uh, 
whatever you do in two weeks of this movie, if it's better than it is now, I'll go with your cut of the movie. So again, I moved in. I stayed up. I mean, I was sleeping four or five hours a night and I was just totally immersed in editing this movie. And uh, I, that's all I did. And after the two weeks, he came in and watched it. And it was significantly different. I'd, I'd restructured some things and cut things down. They watched, he watched the movie and he goes, I love this. And this is terrific. But there's one thing. Do you think that you could open the movie with an action scene? <laughs> there is no action scene. Like, what? Like, I didn't understand. He goes, you know, like, like, what if there was a shootout in the beginning of the movie? And I, I was perplexed. I thought he was putting me on. And I'm, I'm like, you know, you could come up with something. I'll come back. And so I'm like, what? And so I started looking at, like, there was a scene, an actor named Glenn Plummer, who was later in Showgirls, and he was in a movie called Pastime, a good actor. There was a scene where he was running down an alley, and he, like, tripped and fell into a garbage can in a take. It was a blown take. And I was like, what if I use that? And I created <laughs> this audio cacophony of this guy like running from other guys and there were gunshots, you know, and, and, and <laughs> just, and then I have him come running around the corner and, and he, he falls into that garbage can and I made it seem like he's dodging bullets. And then, and then I think I did some voiceover where I'm like, uh, you're not walking away from this one. And then you, you hear these, you hear the cock of a gun and then I'd made in Photoshop, I'd made this title card that said the asphalt quartet and you heard these three gunshots and they blew through the title. And, you know, I used a lens flare tool, so rudimentary. And it was about the best I could come up with. And uh, I showed it to them and they're like, this is great. This is fantastic. How'd you do this? And I'm just like, and that's, we went with, they went with that. And I, I think the only place that ever got released was like Australia. Because when I was in Australia on Superman Returns, I found a copy on DVD and bought it. They renamed the movie Heist. So I kind of thought the Asphalt Quartet was a good title. <clears throat> but um, so that then Mort Salkine said, well, what do you want to do, kid? You want to do something? You want to make a movie? And I said, yes, I do. And I and out of the blue, I said, you know, I've always wanted to make the great Jewish horror film. And he was like, what? And I said, you know, kind of the way vampire mythology is informed by Catholicism. I want to I want to do a, a Jewish horror film that that's informed by Yiddish folk tales with like Osmodius and the Yeni Velt and the Lamed Vav and and use it to deal with the with the uh, origins of anti-Semitism. Well, Mort Salkine was Jew and he was like, this sounds like the greatest movie ever made. And uh <laughs> He goes, what do you want to call it? I, I, I said, it's going to be called Day of Atonement. And I said, I even have an ad line. It's too late to be forgiven. And he's like, this is great. And I'm like, okay. And he's, he's going to gonna pay me to write the script. And then um, I guess I was going to direct the movie. And like that day, my friend Mark Altman, who was the editor-in-chief and founder of of Sci-Fi Universe magazine, which is a magazine that I wrote for. It was we called it the magazine for fans with a life. <clears throat> um, it was a Larry Flint publication, so we're we. I, that's another thing. I was I was the, I was the critic at large writing for this magazine, um, and it was all the L.A. fanboys that you moved to L.A. You could get a job writing on on uh, on Sci-Fi Universe, like Dan Weber wrote, who later went on to work on. Family Guy and Simpsons and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <clears throat> He's a big TV writer. He's been writing on the Simpsons for years. Um, <laughs> so Mark, they sold the magazine out from under him. And I said to Mark, he was all depressed. I go, I got a job for you. We're going to write this movie called Day of Atonement. And we wrote this script and it had everything but the kitchen sink in it. And it was really particularly awful our script. It was really bad. And, um, I'm like, we're, we're the day is coming where we're going to have to turn it in. And I'm like, we can't turn this in. This is just awful. 
And so Swingers had come out and Kevin Smith movies had come out. And I, at this point, my day job was now I was working on the Star Trek experience in Las Vegas that was being built there. And I was editing all the, the company that was, that was building it. I was working for them, editing Star Trek documentary pieces that would go up in, there was a museum at this attraction and you could walk through and see these videos. So Mark calls me up one day and he reads this opening scene of what he called Trekkers. And it was a story I told him about the day that Star Trek The Motion Picture opened where I wore a Starfleet uniform to school. I got taken into the girls' bathroom and beat up. And I was in the seventh grade in junior high school. So Mark had written this scene, but instead of just getting beat up, when I'm on the ground, I have a vision of William Shatner appearing to me and giving me advice. And then, of course, the character gets up and beats up the ninth grader. And I'm like, that's hilarious. And he goes, yeah, what if we what if we wrote a movie just about ourselves? I mean, all your exploits in L.A. and my exploits in L.A. and New York. And and what if what if William Shatner was our imaginary friend and he would show up and just offer us advice and like we'd be friends with him, even though he, he wasn't really there, kind of like Bogart in Woody Allen's Play It Against Sam. And I'm like, well, that sounds really cool. And so we worked on the script. Uh, Mark beat out like a 250 page draft and we started going back and forth and we pared it down. And instead of turning in day of atonement, we turned in Trekkers and Mort Salkheim was like, we got to make this, this is great. And then, um, that that's how it began. (laughs) I'm surprised that he didn't, uh, was he initially shocked that it wasn't what he thought he was going to read though? No, I mean, we told him what what the story was. I, I don't think he particularly cared. Um, I mean, he wanted us to make this movie. And I uh, there, there's still, in it, you know, 25 years later, I kind of still would make the movie. Um, I think David Toma could be rewritten <clears throat> into something pretty cool because subsequently there's been movies that have touched on some of the mythology that um, we, we, were, we were dealing with. So, yeah, it was, it was just terrible though. But he liked it. Mort Salkan liked the script, but he ended up not financing it. And then we went and find we went and found financing elsewhere, and we got the movie made. So, I heard like over the last the uh, last couple of years, the idea of revisiting the movie and putting out a, a director's cut. Uh, a what about the movie was compromised in the post and the shooting that you would actually change about you know it now? And also, I heard something about uh, you letterboxed uh, some stuff. Why was it in one format and then you would uh, use letterboxing now? Well, <clears throat> we shot the movie um, uh, with prime lenses. So prime lenses have fixed fixed focal lengths. And I wanted to shoot it in 239 or 235, 239 to one, like Panavision widescreen. The problem with that is on an independent production, you need a lot of light and you have very shallow depth of field. And we were going to shoot the movie. It was going to be running and gunning. We we shot in 40 locations in 24 days. It was insanity. Um there was no way it would just be impressed. We never would have finished shooting the movie in the time allotted if I'd used prime lenses. And so I couldn't. However, in my mind, I was kind of framing things for the wider aspect ratio. And so when we made it, also I edited the movie myself. And because it was our first movie, Mark and my first movie, I'm very proud of the movie, but it could have been better. And a lot of the a lot of the time we were because we were we had very little time to shoot the film. Uh, we, we you know we needed to be in a location for a full day, but we only had half a day. Then we had a company move, and then we had to move somewhere else and shoot the other half of the day. It was if if I knew and I should have known better, but it was the only way we could get it all done. And I'm I was really proud of the and the film, and I I edited the film, but I've learned so much about editing since then. So I'll give you an example. I really wouldn't change much about the movie 
but I would change almost every edit. I would just accordion the movie down. So I would shave off 10 frames here and five frames here off almost every edit. And it nobody who's seen the movie would really notice, but it would feel much better. And you can see, like I've I've uh, on my own YouTube page, on the Burnett Work YouTube page, you can go and see these recut scenes that I've done, and I I I uh, recompose them into two, three, five. So you can see what it would look like. I'm not convinced that the whole movie necessarily would look good that way, but a lot of movies are shot with an open mat, and they then they they recompose or the. They they re, they don't recompose for the most part. They um, they they protect for two three five or two three nine, so that's the way they shot it. But they can open up the mat if they want it for a TV oh, version yeah. or something. I, I worked at a movie theater and dealt with thirty five millimeter, and they would have uh, if the movie was not in um, if it wasn't mat, uh, matted uh, with the bars at the top and bottom, or if it wasn't scope. Sometimes it was. Uh, there was the extra foot uh, headroom and 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 bottom, and you'd actually have to adjust inside the mat, you know, for the projectors. So yeah, yep, <clears throat> yeah. So it's basically like that. And I think that the movie, what's really interesting is we shot with these Kodak Vision stocks, and because we shot with prime lenses, the movie does have it's very it's it's very simply shot by design, because I just didn't have the time to lay down dolly track or do any kind of really um so it's very simple coverage but i think it has a really interesting look to it and it's it it's only ever existed on video and standard definition it's been out of print since 2006 because our executive producer for whatever reason like doesn't want to allow us to have access to it i think he wants us to raise the money and buy the negative back from him which i would like to do and then be able to put it out because i think it had a very small audience. It won awards at festivals, and I did get to travel around the world with it. It had its world premiere, and I'd always wanted to go to Sigis, Spain. And Sigis is a is a small Mediterranean town uh, about 20 kilometers south of Barcelona, right on the sea. And it's a film festival that's dedicated to science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And like Alvoriaz, I don't think they do Alvoriaz anymore, but I'd wanted to go to Sigis my whole life. And even though Free Enterprise was not, it was not a, it was not a science fiction, fantasy, and horror film, but it was about fans of science fiction, fantasy, and horror film. So I sent it to the festival and lo and behold, it got in. And I'd never even been to Europe. So Free Enterprise had its world premiere in Sigis at the, uh, at the Sigis Film Festival. And it was like, I couldn't believe it was like the highlight of my life and making a movie with my childhood idol and having its world premiere at this science fiction, fantasy, horror and film festival that I'd literally, it's as old as me. So I, I had, I'd want to go there since I'd known about it. It was, it was like, you know, it was interesting because something happened in me. This might sound a little hippy dippy, but when I did that, it was like my goal in life was to make movies. And here I'd made a movie with my childhood idol, with my friends, that was literally about my friends and I. And it was like something in, in me, I had achieved what I set out to do. And maybe you could talk about peaking early, but there was a little bit of inner serenity. I know this sounds strange, but th that was the thing that I most wanted to do in my life. Now, of course, you know, I've continued to make things and I still like to make them, but I'm kind of Zen about my life in the sense that, well, the dream that I had as a child, I achieved it and, and everything else is gravy, you know? And, and that's why after I made it, I spent a year going to meetings and trying to get other jobs and I had an agent and I was, it was, it was an, a monumental waste of time. Because what I should have done, and my big mistake, was not having another movie to make right away. But I was still kind of that fanboy because we were we were forming a company, and after we finished Free Enterprise, we actually produced a movie called The Specials that James Gunn wrote, and Craig Mazin, who recently was the showrunner on Chernobyl and The Last of Us, he directed. So I was a producer on that movie, and then 
after that DVDs came about and I started working on special edition documentaries and I was working on X-Men and Lord of the Rings and Narnia and Superman Returns and all these huge movies. So suddenly I found myself after having made this film back on the sets of these gigantic Hollywood movies, watching them get made. And it was kind of like getting my PhD because I could go anywhere and do anything and talk to anybody about how they were doing their job. So talk about the uh, the transition from um, from working on Free Enterprise to uh, Agent Cody Banks. Well, that was sort of interesting. After so, Mark and I, um, I left the company that I started with, uh, Mark, and I was working on um, home video. You know, a friend of mine, and I I got this after Free Enterprise. You know, I was taking all these meetings, and I had I still had to work. I still had to make money. And, you know, we were just making independent movies. And if you're not making independent movies, there's no one there who's paying you a salary. So I had got a job uh, working at, well, I took a, I took a job, such a weird, this is such a thing about how my career worked. I got a call to work over Christmas uh, of 1999 to cut an Olympic spot for the 2000 Olympics for NBC. And they called me, they asked me if I was available, and I cut a Jesse Owens Olympic spot over Christmas because they needed it so they could start airing it in February. And the Sydney Olympics of 2000 was called the Complete Olympics for NBC. It was MSNBC, CNBC, and NBC itself. So they are going to broadcast the Olympics over these three platforms, which they'd never done before. So they really liked my Olympic spot. And they said, can you and this other producer, David Hartwell, can you – can you just stay on and, and, and cut Olympic spots? And I'm like, and they paid us more money than I'd ever seen. Uh, and they brought me on for like starting in January to cut Olympic spots all the way through the summer. And it was an, an enormous amount of money. Uh, it was incredible. Real TV network money. And after that, they kept me on and brought me, they bumped me upstairs to the primetime department and I started editing primetime promos for their 2000, 2001 fall TV season. And it was, it was incredible, but I wasn't making movies. Suddenly I, I'd made this movie. I directed this film. And at the same time, I'm going to all these meetings, trying to get another film job. And that was just leading nowhere. And, um, I met these people. They wanted to start this film company and it was called endless entertainment. We, it was, it was Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise's former assistant, a girl named Carrie David. And it was this guy named Danny gold who produced a few low budget movies. And then they found me and they said, we would love to form this new company. And we did. And we're like, okay, we we're now a production company. Well, what are we going to do? And Danny said, I, I met this limo driver, this kid, and he wrote this script about a kid, James Bond. What if we optioned that and saw, what if we could get that made? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> sure. And so we did. We went out and optioned the script. So when you get an option, for those of you who don't know, an option is what you're buying is you're buying an option to purchase the script at a later date. But when the for the option period, you control the material. So you buy an option for 12 months or 18 months and you pay like 1500 bucks or hopefully the least amount of money that you can. I think we paid 4500 and then we did notes and we had to get it rewritten and our company teamed up with Jason Alexander's company, Angel Arc, because he was originally going to direct Agent Cody Banks and they were going to look for financing. They couldn't find financing. And then we actually found... Uh, a company, um, well, one of the companies we found, Maverick, M Madonna's company. Guy Oseri ran, ran Maverick. That's why Guy Oseri and, and Madonna are producers on Agent Cody Banks. And it's a much longer story, but then I had my friends, um, um, Zach Stentz and Ashley Miller, who had extensive TV experience. They later went on to write Marvel's Thor and X-Men First Class. We had them come onto the script and rewrite the whole thing and bring it up to professional standards. And we were able to get that script. We sold it to MGM. They bought it. And they said, this was like in February. They fast-tracked it, and by May, it was being shot. 
And it was, it was incredible. And so I, on that movie, it's very funny because of the negotiations and everything. Uh, I'm the, in Hollywood, what you want is what's called the single card credit. So that means only your name's on the card. It doesn't say produced by three other people. And all the people involved, and there's a lot of producers on Cody Banks, were all jockeying for position. I said, you know what? I'll take the co-producer credit, but it's got to be single card. And it doesn't even have to be paid ads. So my name doesn't have to be on the poster. I just want it single card in the main titles. And they're like, oh, okay. So everyone else is jockeying for a position. They're producing. Our fees were the same. Like I, I got the same money I would have got as an executive producer, but I took the co-producer credit. So the, the main titles are at the end of the movie. When you see the credits, everybody, all these producers are sharing their their titles until mine comes on. It's like, whoosh, you know, my name's stretched out, Robert Meyer Burnett. And it was so hilarious when I was at the premiere in Westwood. I, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how the final credits looked. I hadn't seen the final credits. And I just, I burst out laughing in the theater. I mean, I had to, I had to put my hand over my mouth. And I'm like, that's, I really learned you know, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. And <laughs> I negotiated that. And um, I have the same credit on the sequel. The sequel, we really didn't have much to do with the sequel. The sequel was, I thought, really terrible. And as a matter of fact, another important lesson is once we sold the script to the studio, the, the, the movie was originally conceived as Ferris Bueller meets James Bond. And it was it was designed for 16 to 24-year-olds high school into college. That was the target audience. And it was really cool. The script was great. When the studio got it, they decided to make it for tweens, eight to 12 year olds. And there was nothing we could do. And it was, it was a franchise that it could have been it, the tone of it. It's a different kind of movie, but it, it had the same, it was more back to the future. It, if that makes any sense. And when I saw, you know, work on the finished film, I mean, there wasn't, once you sell it to the studio, it's kind of out of your hands. I didn't, I didn't have much to do with the actual production of it because they hired the studio, hires the director and, and we had never produced a feature film at that level. So there was other producers that came in to physically make the movie. I mean, I could have done it actually, but I had never done it at the studio level. And it was kind of heartbreaking because the movie's fine. The sequel's terrible. But if they had used the original script, and it cost like twenty three million, and it ended up making like fifty five or something, but if they if they had gone with the original script, it would have been a two hundred million dollar smash hit. And uh, instead, it was it was a minor hit, I guess. Um, but it's you know, them's the breaks. But suddenly, I'd now produced what it did do was it secured me. Once that happens, it means any other movie I produce. I don't get anything less than that credit. So when I developed and produced the Hills run, what read for Warner brothers in 2008, I didn't even have to negotiate. All I said was I have precedent. I get single card credit. And so for the Hills run red, that was like, yep, there was no negotiating at all. And it was, I developed the project. I brought it to the studio. So, and you know, I, I Joel silver, who I worked, worked for, back in the in 1990 suddenly i was working with him he was our executive producer so that was cool <laughs> so how did um you get involved in doing documentary uh um you know special features and stuff was laurent uh Buzzerow, uh one of your influences yeah no he really was and lo what was really interesting was at full moon after we had done arcade that was the first time, and this is in the early 90s, they would put out on all of their movies, because usually their movies were shorter than 90 minutes, and on a two-hour videotape, they made these things called the Video Zone magazine that would promote other full moon titles. And the first time I ever cut a, a behind-the-scenes documentary piece was for a movie that Full Moon put out called Spirit of the Night, a.k.a. Huntress, and um, or Huntress Spirit of the Night. Uh and so I, I cut this behind the scenes piece and I really liked doing it. It was really cool. And um, while I was working at NBC on the Olympics uh, and I was, I was working at NBC. I was there from nine o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock at night. A friend of mine had a production, a guy named Michael Pellerin had a production company 
in Hollywood. He was working with a guy named Phil Savinick, um, and they had a company called TV is OK. And they had been producing all the documentaries for Disney Laserdiscs. They'd done like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. They Disney in the 90s put out these big, beautiful box sets. They're these white box Laserdisc sets, uh, special editions, absolutely beautiful. And they were doing it for animation and everything. And DVD had just started. And Michael calls me up and he goes, hey, man, um, we're doing we're doing uh, these documentaries for Disney. I'd love you to come to work and maybe cut some for us. And the first thing we're doing is Fantasia. And I was like, what? what? You want me to do a documentary for the, the Fantasia DVD? And D- DVD was just starting to explode. And he goes, yeah. And I go, well, I'm working full time at NBC. He goes, well, that's okay. You can come in at night if you want. I'm like, really? So that summer, the summer of... 2000 i was going to work at nbc cutting olympic spots maybe it was before the summer might have been spring so i would go to work from nine to seven i would leave the office grab something to eat and get to tv is okay by like 7 45 and i would work from like eight at night to two or three in the morning go home go to sleep and be back at nbc at nine o'clock and i was doing that for a couple of months as I worked on Fantasia and I cut this really cool piece on Herman Schulteis. And that was, that was for uh, Fantasia. And then when it was done, they were continuing on, on dinosaurs, but that was all staffed up. And so I went back to work at NBC and I worked at NBC until November of 2000. And one day I walk into NBC and they'd cut 10% of the workforce. And I, I was cut, lost my job. And I was on the verge of getting married. I, I lost a $250,000 a year job in a day. Didn't even know it was coming. And I'm like, wow, I'm effed. <laughs> Typical entertainment business thing. So I go home and I'd moved into this new place that my bride to be was going to move into. And I'm sitting there and it's, I've literally lost my job and I, I've lost my job for like two hours. And I'm sitting at home and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I am just in a pickle here. Um, the phone rings and it's Michael Pellerin again. And he goes, Hey man, listen, uh, we're going to do emperor's new groove. How would you like to come work for me? And then he goes, and you know, I really, I'd love to come. If you, could you come work for me full time? I mean, I can't pay you what NBC is paying you, but you don't want to be cutting network promos. We can work on, you know, we're going to work on Tron. We're going to work on all these cool things. Just come to work for me. And he, 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 Paid me a very, it wasn't $250,000 a year, but having just lost my job two hours previously, I said, Michael, I would, I would love to come to work with you. <laughs> I went in to see him and he, I told him I had to make this much money. He goes, fine. That sounds great. And so I, I started working uh, for Curdy Pellerin and I worked on like Snow White, Emperor's New Groove. And then Michael comes in one day and he goes, um, guess what we're doing? Like, uh, oh i was doing that too he goes lord of the rings and i'm like what and this was like way before lord of the rings was finished and it was at the time people didn't know if it was going to work new line had bet the farm on making all three lord of the rings movies michael pellerin was a fanatical lord of the rings fan and um so michael said yeah man we got the contract to do all three lord of the rings movies wow. and i was like what does that even mean? And and they had already shot. They were in the process of doing pickups on the two towers because uh, they'd shot all three movies at once, like in '99. But but when they say pickups, they were doing like sixty days of pickup shots, and because they were, it's very iterative. They were changing things as they went. And so I'm like, yeah, man. So I was working on Disney titles, and I was doing a, a feature length documentary on Tron. And I started working on Lord of the Rings on Fellowship. And like, Michael would be like, he'd be like, um, who wants to go interview Christopher Lee? And I kind of held back because I wasn't one of the principal people on Lord of the Rings yet. And no one wanted to do it. And I'm like, well, I'll go. Because everybody was scared <laughs> to interview Christopher Lee. And Michael's like, great, we're going to put you on a plane. You're going to go to London and you're going to go interview Christopher Lee. And I'm just like, all right. And so 
now it's 2000. I, Free Enterprise came out theatrically in 1999. It's now 2000. And I am working on DVD special features. I'm working on Lord of the Rings and Tron and then all these other movies. And so it wasn't, I kind of was not focused on trying to get another movie made. Um, and and uh, the, the Cody Banks thing happened. That movie came out in 2003. So all this stuff, I was doing all this stuff and I was so distracted and that went on for a number of years. You know, I, I did, I did Lord, I did Fellowship in Two Towers then Dis- uh, during this time, I, I started, uh, Brian Singer, who I went to film school with, called me, or I was called by MGM, and they asked, they, the, this executive at MGM knew I was friends with Brian Singer and said, we want to do a special edition of The Usual Suspects, but we can't get Brian Singer on, uh, involved, and we can only do it if he's involved. And I said, okay. And I, I went to Michael Peller, and I said, hey, man, um, would you like to do the usual suspects and we'll do the special features. He goes, well, I think we're too busy. And he said, but you can do it. Like if you want to go off and, you know, start your own company, you just have to work for me. Just go do it on weekends. (laughs) I'm like, wait a minute. You want me to start my own production company while I'm working for you full time? He's like, yeah, why not go get the job? (laughs) I was like, all right. So I called Brian and he goes, well, Rob, if you're producing this documentaries, I'll do it. And I said, okay, so Carrie, who I had produced Agent Cody Banks with, I called her and I called my friend Dave Parker. And I said, hey, you guys, you want, you want to go make these uh, special features for MGM? And then we did that. So I had my own company. I called it Ludovico Technique. It still exists. It's a Clockwork Orange reference. <laughs> and so and so I was. that's what we were doing. And like it got so crazy. I was working on – I was in New Zealand working on Two Towers – while we were doing, we were doing the 20th anniversary of Valley Girl and Tron. And so I'm in New Zealand, Dave Parker's in the United States. It was crazy. It was, it was just a crazy, crazy time working on Tron, working on Usual Suspects, Valley Girl, Star Trek Five. I mean, it was insane. It was just insane. And um, yeah. And then after Two Towers, I got a call from Disney and Disney wanted to part ways with Michael because Michael's fees had become so exorbitant and they were working too much on Lord of the Rings that they, they asked me, they said, would you produce the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe disc for us? And I was like, and they, the, the money they were giving me was, I I couldn't believe it. It was seven figures. And I'm like, what? And, and they're like, well, yeah, that's, that's what we want. We want, we want Lord of the Rings, but better. And I'm like, all right. So I took that job. Michael got pissed. He's like, you can't take it. You can't work on another fantasy film shooting in New Zealand. I'm like, well, why not? And he's like, because, because, well, we're doing that. And I'm like, because he thought he was going to get that job. And so I didn't talk to Michael for a while after that. We're friends again. But uh, yeah, I went to New Zealand for 14 months and I uh, was in country with my team. And, and then we did that. And then uh, you can get that four disc special edition and see all the special features. So when I came back, I got a phone call from a guy named Gil Adler, who is the producer of Superman Returns. And he goes, he's like, hey, uh, I don't know you, but apparently you're doing the uh, special features for Superman Returns. And we expect you to be here in Australia for the duration of shooting. And I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian, you're Brian's guy. And I'm like, "Uh, okay. And I had to figure that one out. We had overlap from New Zealand. So I had I was going back and forth between New Zealand and Australia doing both movies. And then I was in Australia for the entirety of 2005. So I'm curious, because, um, you know, the uh, and we'll tr- this, I guess this transitions into uh, the late, great John Schnepp. But the uh, the documentary he made, The Death of Superman, Superman mm. uh, you know, Lives What Happened. So... How? What were you aware of of the failed Superman Lives project and uh, the um, the producer that kind of uh, wanted him not to fly and all that crazy nonsense? Oh, and then, and well, then... <laughs> <laughs> that producer that was producing uh, Superman Lives, Tim Burton Superman Lives, was John Peters. Famously, the movie Shampoo is based on him, and Peter Goober and and John Peters 
had uh, they had produced Batman, you know, and they famously went over to Sony and soaked him for a bunch of money. And he was this very flamboyant guy. So on on Superman Returns, Brian had video and photographs of Nicolas Cage in the suit and all these costume tests, and we would mock them openly. He had this he had this binder he would bring out and he would show people and he'd be like can you believe they were going to make this movie so he had all that and i was going to use a lot of that material in the superman the requiem for krypton documentary but we weren't allowed to um but we knew it was there and and we knew john peters and it was really interesting because john peters never wanted to be on camera but he was very nice and he was very friendly to me big flamboyant guy he would come down to australia and I, I did shoot a few interviews with him and talked with him about the different iterations. But yeah, he was a character. He's still a character. So and so he no. didn't he didn't want to be on camera, but I think isn't he in the documentary Look Up to the Sky that Brian Singer made where he's so he so eloquently was like, For years I I was trying to make it the wrong way, and then this kid shows up and yep. tells me the right way to do it. Yep, that that was him. I think he became more comfortable on uh on camera because he was very conscious of the way he looked. He was, he was, I think he, he went and lost a bunch of weight and had work done maybe. Um, but yeah, so he was, he was, he, once he saw what was going on and started to see dailies and things, then he became very eager to support the movie. How aware well, of Brian's documentary were you while you were doing yours that he, he did the look up to the sky and you know, the documentary? Oh yeah. I was, I, I helped out on that. You know, some of the, there was some footage in that documentary that I actually shot and, um, yeah, it was very – everything that went on with the promotion of, of that was very synergistic. So um, it, it's it's really interesting. On the set – actually, this is how I ended up producing a movie for Warner Brothers. So during that time, they had a division at the studio called um, – uh, I think it was called World, Worldwide Brand Management. And it was presided over by Diane Nelson – and Diane Nelson was responsible for bringing J.K. Rowling to Warner Brothers and securing the rights to Harry Potter. And there was a woman there named Sandy Yee, uh, who was absolutely lovely. And I, because I had cameras with me, what Global Brand Management did was they tried to find uh, corporate partners to sponsor up to promote upcoming movies. Like they'd want, they Pepsi did a Superman Returns promotion where Superman Returns was on Pepsi cans. And in order to do that, they would try and, um, you know, they'd have a filmmaker make a video. Hello, this is Brian Singer on the set of Superman Returns. Hi, Pepsi, please. I mean, they were these kind of things were terrible. And so Brian said, you know, if we're going to do these videos, why don't we make them funny? Like, why don't we turn them into, like, comedy bits and you direct them? And I'm like, okay. So, like... One of the Brian loves Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC. And we would go, like, we'd go on scouts when we went up to the middle of Australia. We'd, in a small town, you could find a KFC, he'd want to go. And I would film him. So we were filming him going to KFCs. And one day, this we get a, a call from Global Brand Management. It was Global Brand Management. It says, uh, Can you guys make a, a corporate sponsorship video for KFC? And I go, Brian, uh, they want us to do a video for KFC. He's like, Oh, you've got all that, you've got all that footage we shot of us going to KFCs. I go, yeah. He goes, we're at lunch. We're going to leave set. So we drive to downtown Sydney to the biggest KFC in downtown Sydney. Brian's like, just keep the camera on. And he's going up to people. Brian Singer is going up to perfect strangers. And he's like, so what did you buy? And uh, Brian's like, oh, yes, that's the three piece feed. I quite enjoy that. And he knew it like the whole menu. And I'm <laughs> filming him. Then we go back to the set and he'd be shooting. And then I would sit there with my laptop and I would edit these hilarious. They were hilarious. And 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 then at the end, he would shoot a button. Like he would, he would literally be on set. And like Brandon would be in full costume. And Brian's like, and here's to you, KFC and action. And then it, it was so insane that we were doing this. And then I sent this stuff back. I would satellite it back to the studio and they went bananas they're like how did you get everybody to, how can you get brandon routh to go be in a corporate spot and what they didn't realize is that i'm 
all day, every day, I'm running around with the camera talking. I'm, I could talk to anybody on set. And I was always sitting right next to Brian at Video Village or whatever. So he, he made sure that the entire crew knew that I was his guy. I could do whatever I wanted and talk to anybody. And I, by this time, I was such an old hand on set. I didn't bother anybody. And I was trying to sell. And people could watch. People knew the documentaries I'd made. Hell, when I was in New Zealand um, working on Two Towers, I got a call from Peter Jackson's office. And uh, they said, uh, Mr. Jackson would like you to show Free Enterprise in the Weta Theater tonight. And I'm like, luckily, I had a copy with me. I mean, it was so, it was crazy. So by, so global brand brand management, the entire duration, um, like like Target, I want to say Target Australia came up with a new slogan called 100% happy. So I'd go in and tell Brian at the beginning of the day, I'd be like, yo, um, Target, we have to do a new video. Target has a new slogan called 100% happy. Brian's like, got it. And then during the day, Brian would be like, Brandon, were you 100% happy with that take? Because I think I'm about 50% happy with that take. And Br- Br- Brandon would be like, he didn't know what we were doing. He just knew. He, Brian's like, well, maybe a 60. And Brian's like, yeah, I want to be 100% happy. So let's do it again. And all day long, Brian would say, make 100% happy jokes. And I was filming them. And all day long, I'd shoot these little things and cut them in my computer. And I put graphics and music and everything. And when we wrapped... And Brian's like, okay, let's see the video. And I would show him the video. He, if he wanted changes, I'd make a few changes. And then I'd leave and satellite that back to Warner Brothers. So that morning, the executives could go in and they would have these global brand management videos. And I might have done 15 of them. And it, they, so it was insane. It was just, and at the same time, Adam Robitel, who directed the Escape Room movies, and he directed the taking of Deborah Logan. I think he directed Insidious 4. We, so Adam Robitel was in the cubicle next to me. And he was cutting these blogs for Brian. Like, here we are on the set of Superman Returns that we were putting online every two weeks. And so, but he, you know, Adam hadn't sold the script yet or hadn't directed anything. So he and I were doing all this stuff together. And um, one day, this is, this is totally an aside, but one day... Brian comes in, and at the same time we were doing our blogs, Peter Jackson was doing his blogs on the making of King Kong. And my DVD crew, Curdy Pellerin, was shooting the behind the scenes on King Kong. And uh, Brian comes in and goes, I was talking to Peter, and I think I'm going to fly over to New Zealand this weekend, and I'm going to pretend, we're going to pretend that Peter's so tired that he can't direct. And we're going to make our side of the blog, and then they're going to make their side of the blog. And we're going to make a dual blog and we're going to release them at the same time. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what? And, and he goes, I, I'm like, he goes, yeah, it's gonna be great. So, you know, I'm just filming Brian. He, he, you know, okay. The phone's ringing and you know, Brian's assistant comes in and goes, uh, Brian, Peter Jackson's on the phone. And, and Brian's a pretty good actor. He's like, Peter Jackson's on the phone. And he picks up the phone. He's like, Hey, Peter. Oh yeah. Really? Oh. And then Brian's like, well, I, you know, I think I could do that. So we shoot all this. Brian goes, goes and flies to New Zealand, and and they shoot their end. And my it's so funny because my old DVD team the, at Curdy Pellerin, they're shooting one end of his, this, and I'm shooting our end. And Adam Robitel's editing our ends together, and so it it was released, but we no one cleared it with the studios, so we had this two part online. Uh, on our side, if you look it up, I, th- I still think it's on YouTube, is called The Call. And they're pretty low down. They're pretty dirty looking now. They, they're not, they were not slickly, by design, by the way. So The Call was Brian's side. And then he goes, and like Naomi Watts is in this, and Brian's directing Naomi Watts. And he's like, so Kong jumps down. And, and then Peter's asleep in his barca lounger <laughs> that's on set. I mean, the whole thing was, it was just hilarious. And, and I, you know, and when it was released, when we put these out, I don't think the studios were necessarily particularly happy. And and what were they going to do? You know, it got a lot of it, it got a lot of traction. And Brian started getting calls, um, like from his agent. His agent's like, "Well, how much did you get paid to work that day on King Kong?" Brian's like, "Come on, man, <laughs> that, that wasn't real." 
<laughs> so, so how did how did uh, that kind of um, hoax turn into the um, the hoax on the blogs of the Outre thing, where basically he was being fake fired and someone else was oh. going to come in and 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 re and direct the film. Okay, so that that was uh, I'm going to take full credit for that one. So so Frank Darabont, director of Shawshank Redemption, The Green Mile, and The Mist, and starter of Walking Dead, he comes to Sydney Fox Sydney Studios where we're shooting to scout locations for a potential Fahrenheit 451 movie. And he's being walked around by executive producer Christopher Lee. And they're they're coming up to me. And um I you know, I was I met him, I'd met him before, and and he's such a nice guy. And I go, hey, what if we what if we shot a blog and we pretended that Brian was getting fired? <laughs> and we would just go around and Frank, you you would like look at the sets and say, Can't we move this wall back a little? And we'll just shoot it. And we didn't tell anybody, you know, and and like he was going up to like Kate Bosworth and going, you know, Kate, uh, and Frank was crushing it. And he's like, uh, I'm, I'm taking over. And, and we didn't tell anybody that this wasn't true. So people were freaking out and, and we did this for the whole day. And then we, we cut together a much longer version of it. And we thought Brian thought it was the funniest thing ever. He was just howling. We are going to release it. And Brian stopped, comes in. He goes, we can't release this video. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, if people thought I was, my agent wanted to know how much I was being paid to direct King Kong. If we release this video, it's going to be on the cover of Variety that I've been fired off of Superman Returns. People aren't going to know it's not because Peter Jackson had done uh, uh a, a sequel blog saying that King Kong was going to, they were going to do a sequel where like King Kong fights the Nazis or something. And people believe that. So, and it was really, Frank Darabont was really convincing and the video was really convincing. So we didn't release it. However, Brian did come to me and go, okay, look, if we do a cut down version and it's a really cut down version, we can put it on the, the box set, yeah. the Superman Blu-ray box set. And I'm like, okay, and then we did this other one with Cal Penn that never saw the light of day. So Outre, Outre is on, it's on the, it's a truncated version of Outre though, because the long version was just scathing. And I think that, yeah, it was just, it was scathing. It was scathing to Brian. And, and it was just, it was ruthless, but it was funny. <laughs> so I'm a filmmaker as well. And I do uh, fiction storytelling and I'm also, I do some documentary stuff as well explain for the audience um for the viewers let's use uh, requiem for krypton as an example uh when you go into a project like that how do you know the format that you're going to be uh chasing you know and then how do you course correct as you're getting the stories to fit what your uh, story you're trying to tell is like how, how do you do that that's a that's a good that's a good question um well, okay, let me let me ask you first of all, when you're doing your stuff, how what do you like to shoot on? Like I know n now, I was shooting this stuff um, you know, heck 18 years ago. But today, uh do you shoot on like do you use DSLRs or do you use video cameras? What do you usually shoot on reds? Because I have sometimes when uh, I'm doing the documentaries, I have different DPs that are uh, right. shooting depending on where I'm shooting. Um We've shot on S, uh, solid state drives on the Black Magic. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I've shot on uh, uh, Sony uh, AS A seven threes. I've nice. shot on some Canons. Um, some of them are D, uh, uh, SD cards, and some of them yeah, are yeah. solid solid state. Um, yeah, yeah. And we and we shoot in four K, even though we're not going to post in four K. It'll we frame it a little wider, and then it allows us to recrop, reposition. Actually, yeah. All the short films I shoot are always shot in 4K and framed just a little wider. Yep. And then uh and then it allows for either you scale it to exactly the same frame or you crop it and and you it allows you the flexibility to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's um it's so great that that we have those tools now. Um back then, so I we started out shooting on Panasonic's uh, and we are using HDV tape 
back then. And at first we were shooting, it was still standard def, but we were shooting a uh, progressive scan and it, it, it looked great. But while we were shooting after the first month, Sony released their prosumer HDV uh, high definition cameras. I want to say it was the Z1. And I had bought four of them uh, for, I bought a total of five, but one of them was for somebody on the crew. And we started shooting the behind the scenes in HD. Unfortunately, they didn't want the finished documentary in HD, which was made me crush my soul um because it's the footage it doesn't really mix and match well it was it was kind of a bummer but so we were shooting on hdv tape and when i'm doing documentaries um see the thing is like when when people are shooting epks electronic press kits they're just kind of hanging back and getting b-roll when I'm making documentaries like on Superman Returns, I thought of it as a reality television show. And I wanted all the members of the crew, because people on film sets for the most part can be characters unto themselves. Yeah, And so I kind of wanted to have, if I could make mini storylines or I wanted to focus on what people were doing, but it, it had to be fun, you know? And, and I was always so, and, and for, I didn't want to do any sit down interviews with anyone because that I'm there and because obviously you always see these talking head interviews covered with b-roll I don't want to do that and I figured I'm there you know I'm with cameras and and I, I got cameras wherever I want to go so I'm like okay explain the shot to me what's happening and I could get people it was still talking heads but we're on set you know there's stuff going on in the background so that's that's kind of in this we brought in there was the same of same thing we did on Narnia and so in my mind, it was like, I want to, I want to make these characters like Guy Dias, the production designer. He, he's just a character. He's an incredibly talented guy, but he was just funny. And he grew up on a chicken farm. And one time he's wrangling chickens. I'm like, oh, this is the best. And so what I, I, I didn't have any, I didn't have any agenda in terms of the story, how the story was going to unfold. What I wanted to show though, was all the different kinds of people that are on a movie set and all the different things each one of their jobs entails. And then at the same time, how much fun we were all having. And so I didn't know quite how it was all going to be put together. I think the best example in the Requiem for Krypton documentary, Superman on the Farm, there's a section called Superman on the Farm. I wish we had more time to do it, but that that section, it's like a half an hour long best exemplifies what I was trying to go for. And if I had more time to finish those documentaries, they would have felt more like that. But um, I thought Superman on the Farm, we did a good job of telling the story, introducing everybody to the characters, showing humorous situations, but also having sort of this heartwarming, you know, we're in the middle of Australia where they built this amazing set with incredible sunsets every night, using these brand new Panavision Genesis cameras. Um, and I, I wanted to create emotion, you know, the, the, that the, the process of creation, there's a joy, joy in it. And I guess, like, let me ask you this. When, you, when you're shooting, when you make your documentaries, do you, do you have a preconceived – I mean, obviously, every documentarian has a – they have a story they want to tell, usually of some kind, if you're delving into a certain subject matter. So you know you want to cover it. But do you give yourself leeway to discover more to the story when you're – when you're actually on set shooting? Um, well, I can tell you um, that the first two documentaries I did were about the two feature movies I actually made. And since I was on set every day, I knew all the juicy stuff, so I knew exactly what to ask. So I just, after the fact, when the distributor wanted the movie on DVD, I actually just knew what kind of questions to ask. And, and most people were very uh, disarmed and they were able to open up. Um, the latest thing I'm doing right now is a documentary about the city of Jacksonville, how it's a film. It used to be a film hub in the silent era. Uh, right. You know, all the all the acts would come down and shoot during the winter months. And so, yeah, because you have vaudeville and stuff down there, right? Oh, oh, yeah, and uh, um, um, Oliver Hardy, and yeah. uh, a lot of a lot of stuff. And so, I'm in, I'm interviewing people that are in the independent film community now, and I'm interviewing people that have that work at a, at the uh, 
last remaining uh, silent film studio, Norman Studios, which uh, championed uh, strong African-American uh, stories. They weren't going to just do stereotypical roles. They were going to be heroes like the Fly. Wow, Ace that sounds with... great, man. It, it's it, it's a challenging documentary because you can't tell every single story that's told. But I have o over 60 interviews and each person gets about 20 to 30 minutes on camera. Um, and it's a challenge because I'm the editor too. So I'm sitting there watching and it's broken up into chapters. So you can be telling a story in a nonlinear way. You can be focused. Um, kind of like how the Snyder cut of, uh, of, uh, justice league is in chapters. So you can right. actually just, you know, keep that in that way. Um, but it's very interesting when you're doing a story, a documentary about a community and not just one topic because some people don't want to be interviewed because they're um, they're either suspect, they're not sure what your what the agenda is, so they don't want to say the wrong thing and it be taken out of context. Uh, some people are camera shy, so you the biggest challenge is there are narrative gaps left because some people just are shy and don't want to be in it. So you have right. to you have to talk around that, or if you're allowed to use imagery or um, behind the scenes clips of things you can kind of their presence is there represented without them being there so it, it, it's challenging i don't did you ever have that on any of the documentaries you did for brian singer or for any of the stuff where someone just didn't want to come back and be interviewed or participate yeah i mean there are times you, you know like there are times a, a lot of the time they didn't want to come back they wanted to get paid like like David Warner's manager wanted us to pay him when we were doing the Tron documentary. And I'm like, we just, you know, we don't do that. We don't have the, we don't have enough money to pay people. And once you pay people, then everybody wants to get paid. And for these, when we were doing retrospective documentaries, we weren't able to, to get people sometimes just because it was a money thing or people didn't want to talk about the movie. They might not have had a good experience on it or um, things like that. And then I've done other non-film related documentaries where people just the same thing. They don't want to talk or or they feel they shouldn't talk. Uh -huh. um, and I but for the most part, because I've I've mostly been my documentary work has been about the movies and, and about yeah. Star Trek or whatever. So people are have always been pretty much game to talk. But you know, there's a I've uh, there's a couple of documentaries that I've wanted to make about like I really want to do a, a documentary on the history of home entertainment. Um and I you know I I've sh shot a few things for it but because I lived through it. You know, I started working at a, a like I said early on the a video store that was like the second video store in the nation and then I've worked I worked in video retailing from 1980 to 88 and then working in working in the home video era and even now, you know, the last the last documentaries we made was for Hills Run Red when Scream Factory put them out. And we did those during the pandemic. And um, I'd love to do that because how, and, and my underlying thesis would be how our relationship with motion pictures changed because of home video. The idea that you could take a movie home, people take it for granted now, but that didn't exist in 1977. You know, and then as no. as things changed and what what does it mean? And, and I think that the, that, the i think movies now are taken for granted and our culture is less special because of it well i'll People tell you a little story that um when we made the two feature movies that we made um we made them for sweat equity so they we, we weren't our budget wasn't really you know it wasn't a lot of liquid you know, I mean, we we fed people. Right. Yeah. Just, yeah. No. Uh, we fed, yes. No. We we fed people, uh, and we paid for blood effects and things like that. But uh, nobody, people were giving over their time, so there wasn't actual. Um, if the movie didn't make that certain amount of money, it wasn't going to be that a wash. So we had a choice: we could get the movie, just put it out on streaming on some site, um, and it might really not make that much money. But it'll never be on a shelf. It'll never be somewhere on a shelf. And we found this company, Bayview Entertainment, that they are a boutique label for low-budget indie filmmakers. And they said, you know, we will press the movie on DVD. 
even though it's shot on HD, the HD version will be seen on Amazon and Tubi yeah, and stuff. Right. But the DVD, um, it'll be in standard definition. And they said, we'll put out a release. And then they did it for both those movies, which – Frankly, both of those movies are kind of grindhouse kind of yeah. kind of films. So the fact that they look a little like shit on DVD is actually it, it, it's like watching an old VHS cassette. Yeah, it's a plus, right? Uh, like watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre on D on VHS. It, it it you feel like you're gonna catch something just watching the movie. It's so dirty. <laughs> and perhaps you will. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, now I have a question. Uh, I'm curious. I so Toby Hooper famously has said that when they cleaned the movie up because they shot on 16 and yep. they blew it up to 35 when they put it on 4k they took the original 16 and they put and they put transferred that to the blu-ray and the 4k so it actually never had that process of the the blowing it up to 35 and he says you know it's a shame that everybody watched that movie in a washed out gritty grindhouse format because he says I never made a movie to look like crap. Right. Uh, I, I wanted it to look beautiful. And Daniel Pearl's cinematography, uh, m when you watch the Blu-ray, I got it on, um, I think, Second Sight and Dark Sky. They put it out on uh, in on uh, 4K. Yeah, um, I'm waiting for my – I have my Second Sight, but I, I had ordered a couple things together, and uh, like Picnic at Hanging Rock. I think they're waiting to send it all to me in one package. I got Chainsaw 1 and Chainsaw 2 um, on 4K, and it – is night and day when you can you can see the pores in people's skin you know yeah. you can see just the the beauty in the ugliness you know there's right. a, there's a be there's a beauty there even like uh like hr giger when he did the the um xenomorph and the uh, derelict ship and everything for alien that there is a beauty in the grotesque it's not just hideous it, there's a beauty to it I yeah it's it's incredible. I mean the the 4K the, you know that's going to be the end of physical media. It's going to end at 4K and which is fine because the human eye you know we can't perceive much beyond 4K anyway. And it's so great that we got here. And you know having been buying uh, physical media since 1980, I mean I can't believe I've been buying movies for 43 years and how many movies I've bought over and over again. Oh, yeah. And every time I every time I get to the 4K version of something, I'm like, oh, you know, like uh, I just got uh, the the second sight uh, Martin, you know, the George Romero Martin. I actually owned a 16 millimeter print nice. of this movie, and to see it in this, you know, with the book and everything, the second sight does. It's so they found a lost version of that movie, a longer cut. Yeah, and they couldn't get the rights or something to release it. I desperately wanted to see uh, R Richard Rubinstein uh, apparently uh, is very proprietary he's just there's certain rights that he has and he holds on to them and and apparently getting a lot of that old Romero uh, uh, um, library released it, it it happens very arbitrarily it's yeah. it's not in there's no li rhyme or reason to it no it's very it's crazy but it's great to have this stuff you know, and and I never thought because in the home in the VHS era, like you could never get uncut versions of Dario Argento's Suspiria. You know, you could never get that stuff. And and now, I mean, gosh, the 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 releases of these things like Deep Red and Suspiria are stunning. Like, was it Don May over at Synapse? It was his lifelong ambition to to make a decent the 4K version of Suspiria, and it they just did a spectacular spectacular job with oh that yeah movie. i i have it. It, it it's and it's also loaded with content there's yeah. so much goodies uh some of my favorite argento movies are not actually the ones that people consider to be because obviously suspiria is the landmark and it's the gold standard um his giallo films uh tenebrae phenomena and an opera are actually those some are of my favorites yeah, me too. I I love all three of those movies. And again, phenomena. You know, we got that even in America. The the version, the creepers, creepers. version was yeah. totally truncated and terrible. And it's great to get those four K box sets, man. And it's amazing that um, did did you uh you you find out that uh, Budalucci and uh, Argento wrote what uh for Sergio Leone Once Upon a Time in the West. Yep. Which is such. I mean, that's coming out in four K too. I love that movie. Oh yeah, the man with the harmonica. Oh, so good. 
such a great it's a great film i mean and it's great to see this stuff i you know it's it's just a shame though i think that young people are not you know they movies just don't hold the same place anymore in the world of, of tiktok and reels and instagram and and all that which i understand but but when i was growing up getting getting to see these things um wasn't you know we were looking outward we were looking out at art and and now now the youth is is looking they're the they're the protagonists in their own media you know whether they're starring in reels or instagram or whatever they're doing yeah. tiktok but for me i was always looking outward at the the grand masters of cinema it's just a different time i guess oh yeah i mean i grew up in a uh I was not a film brat because it was in New York and it wasn't around the L.A. stuff. But my dad actually, being a filmmaker, actually worked in 35 millimeter. He had his own company. Uh, he worked with R. Greenberg and Associates in oh, New wow. York. Oh, wow. Yep. Um, and he wor he cut the trailer for The Wiz. Um, yeah. <laughs> he, wor he worked on uh, Fanta commercials. Um, he worked... Yep. Uh, he the movie the song remains the same about Led yeah, Zeppelin. My dad my dad actually worked on that film. At, um, he got through happenstance was checking out equipment in a in a rental store to a roadshow uh, uh, production group, and he didn't notice that the work order said Zeppelin. But somebody came in and said they were missing, you know, some in a. Uh, that we're missing somebody essential to getting the crew, and he says, "I'll do it." And so he checked out the equipment, quit his job, and he worked on that uh, that that, that uh, production. Wow, that is um, so cool! And growing up, he would always bring home either, you know, a telecine VHS of something that wasn't out yet, or um, you know, oh, I have an early print of this, or here's a movie no one's ever heard of, and there's a movie that he. Uh, brought home, and it was a, by a guy named Mike Jitlove, and oh, uh, yeah, the Wizard, uh, of, Speed the Wizard of Speed and Time. Yeah, and we watched that movie, and it's corny as hell, but it's so fun to watch. You know, I'll tell you something. When I first uh, got into home video, I had a friend named Steve Pitcher who had all of Mike Jitlove's short films. And the original version of Wizard of Speed and Time, I want to say the short was done for a, a Disney special. And then the, the feature was made later out of, it came out of that that special. But he had made a lot of other, uh, other uh, stop motion shorts and he was a genius. I actually had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times. And um, he always wore that green, he had a green green windbreaker. Oh yeah, I that remember he wore. the movie. And yeah, he, he, he was a, he was an interesting guy, but when I met him, you know, I said, you know, I, I saw boot he hated the fact because he sold his movies. He sold his shorts and he hated when people said he, they saw bootleg versions on video. He's like, oh, I wish I remembered selling those them to them. But um, yeah, he was he was great. And he, I want to say he came to USC when I was there, but I met him a couple times in the, my early life here in L.A. in the late 80s, early 90s. But he was an incredibly talented guy. And I wish he'd done more work. I remember hearing um, filmmakers like, uh, you know, John Carpenter and film filmmakers like that that went to G U USC, and they said that their uh, people that come to lectured was like uh, Hitchcock and and people like that. D when you were at the school, did you ever have um, really big uh, Hollywood uh, filmmakers come and do the lecturing there? Oh yeah, there are there are always people like you know William Friedkin came down a lot. Nice. Like I was a huge William Friedkin fan, and 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 there, <laughs> I had this I had this class that I actually got a job. I got I I got hired out of it to be an intern, but it was a Tuesday night class called the Visiting Artists Seminar, and it was taught by a guy named Max Lamb, and you know people like Joel Schumacher would come down, and then he had directed. I want to say. It was before it was it was after Lost Boys, but before Flatliners, and you know he just came down and it was the class had like twenty two people in it, and uh, he would just he he was so funny when he came down he sat Indian style on a desk he just got on the desk and sat Indian style and they would just come down and and stay there for three or four hours and didn't talk to Schum us. didn't Schumacher direct uh, was it DC Cab Yep Yep 
Yeah, Schumacher, and, and uh, he did uh, The Incredible Shrinking Woman. And, um, you know, then he went on and did, like, Falling Down, which is probably one of his best movies. Oh, I love um, that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was he was really, really nice. And I saw him, after that, I saw him on the set of Flatliners because the, 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 they were shooting that on the Warner lot. And um, he was a, he was just a, he was a really nice guy, really gregarious, really gregarious guy. Um, really liked Fla- him a lot. Flatliners is a movie they didn't need to remake. That original is so good. Oh uh, yeah, it's and it's so beautiful. Yeah, that remake they've they've made some really terrible remakes over the last. Jacob's you know they remade Jacob's Ladder. It's like yeesh. The, the original movie is brilliant. You know, I know Adrian Lin's movie, and uh, I mean, how, and how do you remake? Point Break. I mean, Campia says all the time they remade it or they called it Fast and the Furious. Yeah, it's true too. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. I I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, it, it's it's such a, RoboCop. You know, how do you remake RoboCop? The only one scene in the re- remake of RoboCop that I thought was clever was the moment he wakes up and he realizes he's like who am i where am i and the and gary Oldman's like oh i'll show you and suddenly all of his limbs and his torso come apart and all he is is a head and then he realizes what happened but it, the movie sucks because it's, it's missing that and Ro- and total recall it's missing the black humor it's miss, missing the satire that Ver, verhoeven uh famously put in his films i mean I'm one of the few people I know that actually liked Showgirls because I realized it was supposed to be a cocaine induced uh, excess film. Yes. It's meant to, it's it's meant to be satire. Yes, it is. It is. And ha- I can't wait to get that Vinegar Syndrome 4K. <laughs> There's a movie that Verhoeven made that I still haven't seen. It was it called Black Book. Yeah, Black Book with Clarice Hout- uh, uh, Houghton. I heard it, it's I heard it's really good because it's it's like a revenge plot that deals with somebody uh, that had gone through the camps and, and uh, yeah was it's, tr- it's that I loved the Dutch were so devastated by the World War Two that that you, you know they could make a movie about shopping and they would figure out some way to tie it into how devastating World War Two was for them and it was fantastic um, so Black Book it's actually a very very good movie and, and I, I believe. I want to say that I have the 101 Films version of it on Blu-ray. Uh, it's, but it's good. Verhoeven and Carpenter are two of my favorite filmmakers. Um, yep. They, uh, they have a voice, a specific voice. Um, everything that Verhoeven does when he's either when he's using uh, Jas Vacantu uh, or uh, Jan de Bont as his yep. uh, D- DPs. Um, and it, it's interesting that, um, like, Jan actually uh, went on to become a director, but he also did the d- d- DPing work for, um, you know, uh, for, um, you know, Predator and, and, and for McTiernan and stuff. Yeah, um, for October. Those movies have a certain look to them. And um, as an example, uh, if you watch Predator um, – the movie, even though it's a schlocky popcorn movie, uh, and um, but it's perfectly executed. The movie is, it's a thriller for the first half where it's dealing with that stuff. And then once they realize that it's an alien, then it switches. Um, I've heard people say some of those movies, they're better than they have a right to be. Because on paper, they're like, what the hell is this? But then an artist does it, like Ridley Scott making Alien. It was supposed to be a schlocky B film, and the movie's a work of art. Yeah. Yep. 100%. So you end, you ended, you're a filmmaker, and you've chronicled documentaries for the making of other people's movies, and then you transitioned into doing um, – you know, um, working in this kind of capacity where, you know, you, you talk to people, you're in a round table with other, uh, pundits. How did you get to meet, um, John Schnepp and Amy Dallin and, uh, all those folks? Well, I had known, you know, just bumping around LA, you, you, within the fan communities, you end up meeting, just meeting people. 
And I don't remember, I don't know if my friend Mary Forrest introduced me to John Schnepp first, but you know, we'd go to events together and you just meet people. And the LA, there's a, there's a, a big group of fans, real diehard fans that came to LA to work in the entertainment business. And, um, and eventually everybody meets everybody else and you either work together and f- like during the, au- during the, um, aughts, you know, I did a lot of, I bumped around with John a lot. I got, he was making a lot of short films and doing things and I would get them shown at like Comic-Con for him. Cause I knew the programmers and stuff there and, um, we became friends. And so in 2015, he calls me up one day and he goes, Hey, you know, I'm on this new show, uh, AMC heroes. It's on YouTube. And I didn't pay much attention to YouTube. Um, I, um, because I just, I watched trailers and stuff on YouTube, but I didn't pay much attention to it. Like, I didn't watch shows that were on YouTube. And he goes, yeah, it's this, this comic book show, and why don't you come on it? And it was the sixth episode of AMC Heroes. And I went into the Collider offices, and um, I met John Schnepp and there, and he introduced me to John Campia. And he goes, yeah, we're going to sit down and uh, we're going to talk about comics and comic related stuff. And I went, oh, and it was they liked what I did and they kept bringing me back. And then eventually I was a, a regular and and Amy Dallin, who I like very much, worked at a, a comic book store called House of Secrets. And then she be- came on the show and we started doing it at one point. We we're doing it daily and uh, it was just a lot of fun. And then I worked for uh uh, I worked on Collider Heroes for three years till till John Schnepp passed away, and then things got a little weird at Collider, and um, I left Heroes but stayed on the Schmodown, and um, it was fun. And then after our Collider, kind of there was a lot of things that happened, but it kind of imploded and changed, and um, I left. And then John Campy called me and said, "Come, let's do a let's do the Weekly Hero together," and that was back in 2018. And then up until recently, I was working with him. So from 2018 till now, if in in August of this year, it would be five years that I was working with John. There's so many different uh, voices in the pundit community, and I I, I really liked the uh, the um, the guys that did the schmodown. Um, and Mark, I really Mark, Mark Ellison and, and Christian Harloff. Yeah, I thought yeah. they did a great job. And and Mark Ellis is a very talented stand-up comedian in his own right and and i mean there's so many there's countless people too many to list but i mean y- you have uh perry nemiroff is is uh, is definitely an engaging personality chris carr um who yeah. does you know she's an actress herself yep. but also is on as a pundit and the people that, that have those they're not they must not be introverted because they just they exhibit so much uh personality and enthusiasm what they do yeah i mean it's and it's great to meet I, I mean there's a lot of people that are that are i i think you know certain for me i'd been speaking I, I worked in retail from the time i was a little kid and then i i spoke a lot at conventions and then working with on film sets and things you have to quickly learn how to navigate and talk to everybody all different kinds of personalities and so i've already always been gregarious so it was not hard for me to to do that and it's so funny because we're i'm just talking about stuff that i love so it's a joy to be on these shows and it's interesting to see and it's not like when i was writing for sci-fi universe magazine the the um um there wasn't very this fan community obviously there was no youtube so there was no way to have this large gigantic community of people i mean you you had your readers who would read your magazine but it wasn't like it is today i'm wondering and this is like an inside baseball kind of thing but um the sh- the show's live when you when you whenever you do those live shows or even when <laughs> even 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 when it's your own show yeah um sometimes it's single cam you know it cuts from person to person sometimes it's split screen so you can see a person's reaction to what's being said live and there's been a couple of times I've watched people's shows where the moment someone says something, you get whoever's running the show or someone else who's moderating, you can sense the moment the other person said it, the other person, you can see the reaction on their face. It's like, yeah, mm, 
you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, so sometimes it's interesting to watch those live things. And it makes me wonder, is there ever like with rate, you know, like with radio, how they have when it's live, there's a delayed. Um, a, a oh, there's delay. no there's no delay. <laughs> yeah. How do you um, what is a uh, postmortem uh, after the show meeting like when someone has actually uh, dropped something that maybe shouldn't have been said? You know, who that's a good question. I mean, it doesn't happen much, but. Um, my, like John and I, the only beef that we would ever get into is if I went on someone else's show, <laughs> you know, and said something and you would get mad, but, but you, we would just have conversations about it. Like, like John, sometimes if one of us said something and we didn't put it in the proper, if we didn't frame it in the proper words, John might say, well, we, we don't want anything to be misconstrued that this happened. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, um, so it, it's, it gets it get, can get a little weird sometimes, but for the most part, you know, you're moving so fast. Like the other night, like I'll make mistakes and somebody will correct me. And I'll, like I, I was talking about black exploitation movies and I was thinking about Shaft and Slaughter. And I was thinking, I said Slaughter, Slaughter in Africa, but it's actually Shaft in Africa. And Slaughter's <laughs> big score is really Shaft's big score. And yeah. sometimes, because I have so much rattling around in my head when you're, when you're, doing things live i make i find myself i tend to make mistakes just because of so much information and, and when you're talking you don't have time to think and there is no teleprompter yeah so you know you're looking at the camera and you're you're trying to formulate opinions at the same time you're collating data and information and i find sometimes i the the older i get i make a few more mistakes so and i don't want to do that but i i correct myself but sometimes it's hard and then sometimes like you might know something about a movie and people you know i'll spoil something i won't mean to but just because you're th i'm thinking about it in a different context i'm thinking about it well you know because this happens in the film and you will have you will have revealed something that you shouldn't have revealed and i'm like oh i shouldn't have said that <laughs> but so what insp what inspired um you to create your own channel and then also the stuff with uh, Elizabeth winding winding with Elizabeth and then the uh, designing Hollywood how did all that come about well it was John Schnepp who said that I should start my own YouTube channel he's like you have a pretty interesting perspective you're always pretty energetic and are having a good time you should start your own YouTube channel I'm like I I, I didn't know what it would be and it was Elizabeth who bought me this microphone f heck five years ago and um and I, 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 at first I wanted to do like these documentary shows. And the first episode of Rob Observations, I went up and visited my friend in Olympia, Washington, who built a one to one scale land speeder from Star Wars. And so I went up there and shot it, but I just didn't have enough time. It took me like three months to get that whole episode done. And I found it was much easier to do live streams. And um, I figured my philosophy was I wanted to, it would be like I'm the guest at a panel discussion at comic-con or at the world science fiction convention so that's how i would approach it you know i try to make every topic i i would i go see this topic at a convention s s people speaking about that topic and then with elizabeth you know it was COVID, and we were both like well, what can we do to together to be just something we could do fun and we started doing whining about movies which we're going to bring back where we would watch a movie and, and share a bottle of wine and talk about it and um you know and then d designing hollywood i met met uh martika abara the producer at a party at john's house and it was so funny martika goes i work for work with marilyn vance i went marilyn vance the marilyn vance the costume she's, designer she's a legend i know and she goes she goes well yeah i go do you know there wouldn't be euro terrorists if you're if marilyn vance didn't dress them in die hard <laughs> I mean, they're the most <laughs> iconic, and 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 I said, I'm still looking for the leather duster that Michael Pere wore in Streets of Fire, and and she just started laughing, and and then I said, what about that that two tone leather jacket Ferris Bueller wore? And, and Martika's like, wait a minute, you just know who Marilyn is and know what movie she's worked on, and I'm like, yeah, and she's like, oh, we got to talk to you further, and they they asked me to host Designing Hollywood like two years ago. And it's been so, I mean, I, I can't believe it, the people that I talk to. And um, it's funny because we're branching out. We're going to do more than just costume designers. And I talked to 
Peter Devlin, who records, he records this on set sound dialogue and stuff on movies. And he's worked on all these incredible movies. And I'm like, I don't know if, 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 if he's going to be the best person. And it turns out he was a great guest. He had so many stories because, you know, when you're recording all the dialogue on all the movies that he was recording that he's worked on, I mean, the guy's a legend. He's worked with everybody. And he's this kind of quiet, soft spoken, Irish guy with an incredible sense of humor and his stories. I mean, I was leaning into the microphone and this is amazing. It's amazing. So often when uh, you, you watch shows and, and the pundits, they'll discuss uh, their favorite movies and then they'll talk about the merits of doing a director's cut or an altered version. Cause you know, once it gets released to the, the public, it's in the zeitgeist. That's the movie warts and all. And then so sometimes when you go back and you dick around with it and you add extra beats, it's not the film that um, the people remember. One of my best friends, Kurt, his favorite movie of all time is The Wrath of Khan. He goes, the movie that was in the theater is the film. He goes, when I watch the director's cut, there's those extra beats. And he goes, M like with music, he said, the timing is just off. It doesn't feel like the movie I love. Um, but I know that you actually love the motion picture uh, and, oh, actually, yeah. and actually prefer it to Wrath of Khan. Um, well, so speak to that and also the revamped director's edition, you know, that they just came out with. I, okay, here's the thing. The re, Star Trek, the motion picture is my favorite Star Trek movie. I wouldn't say it's the best Star Trek movie. I would say Star, I would give that to Star Trek two, okay. but on, only because as a kid growing up and loving Star Trek so much, I never thought I would see more Star Trek. And when Star Trek came out to see my friends, the you know, my childhood idols again and seeing the Enterprise so grand on the big screen and and I I for all, for people saying, "Oh, it's a retread of the Changeling episode." I'm like, "No, it's it the 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 real cosmic infinitude of all of it." I I loved it. I think and I could I'll make a case that it's the most Star Trek of all the Star Trek movies, but the thing is it was un, it was unfinished. You know, it was always an unfinished work that was rushed into theaters. And there's various iterations of it. And the new 4K director's cut, I think, is the closest version to it being done. But it's still not it's still not complete And to me. And I think that, you know, when the guys who did it and they're friends of mine, Darren Doctorman, they were working with Bob Weiss, but they also had their own, their own, ideas of things that should happen in the movie they they basically made some they made directorial choices that i think were not necessarily the right choices to make and i think what they really needed was they needed another director to come in and finalize the film i think that's what they that's the one thing that they were missing and um but still it's the best version of the movie that's ever existed and i i i do love that in terms of wrath of khan um, I too think the theatrical version is the best version, and luckily they're both available on um, on 4K. What about the Undiscovered Country? Which one do you prefer? I, on I prefer one? on that. I prefer the longer version. I, you know, it's funny. I read a, a script, a script version of of the Undiscovered Country that was longer, and it had a whole opening scene where they had to gather. Like Uhura was a radio talk show host, you know, and they had to, <laughs> they had to get her. They had to put the team back together. Um, I like the I like the the cons the conspiracy. I like the idea that the Klingons, the Romulans, and the Federation certain s elements conspired to keep the war going, and I thought that was interesting. And I I missed I missed that in the theatrical version. I wish that it was much more of a Tom Clancy esque plot. But yeah, I mean when you're when you know a movie so well, and then you see a director's cut, a lot of the time it feels extraneous. Um, Although sometimes I think like the third ver I think both the third version of Apocalypse Now and the final cut, the third version that Spielberg did of Close Encounters are definitive for me. Um, where you have all the stuff where he's in Close Encounters where he's ruining his living room and builds the Devil's Tower and you have the airport footage and but you don't have when he goes into the mothership. I think that's the best version of the film. And the final cut, like Apocalypse Now Redux is all over the place and the theatrical oh, yeah. version I love, but the final cut uh, is a great amalgamation of the two. So, what, about Bla what about Blade Runner? Um, the one with the voiceover or uh, that, the one without? See, for me, I mean, I live, I, I saw the Blade Runner, the first show. And to me, I can't 
not hear the voiceover when I watch Blade Runner, no matter what version I'm watching, even the final cut of Blade Runner, which is great, but I hear they don't advertise for killers in the newspaper. I can't. Well, sushi. That's what my ex-wife called me. Would you say a perfect version of Blade Runner would be the one with the voiceover, but ending on the elevator door shutting and not the happy ending? Yeah, I think so. I, I and but also the there's a lot of refinements and things in the final cut that I that I like. I mean, I remember going to the first screening. It was a there was a it was at the Academy and it was about visions. They were doing a festival of visions of L.A. on cinema, and in, in on film. And and I went to the screening of Blade Runner, and I knew that movie like the back of my hand. I had the videotape when it first came out, and watching that in the theater, that first time, I'm like, this is. This is not the theatrical version of Blade Runner. And there was all this stuff in there. And the whole theater, everybody, we're all Blade Runner fanatics and we're seeing it in this this huge theater. And I'm like, we're like, what is this? Yeah. You know, and it was the first time that it got out that there were other iterations of Blade Runner. And that's where the legend began. And there's all the different versions, the different cuts and things like that. But but that happens, you know, all movies, as you know, you do various iterations of your film and you you hone it as you're cutting it down and getting to the best version of the movie. So Pepsi Challenge, is rec- uh, Dick, Richard Deckard a replicant? Uh, he is not. Because if he is a replicant, the movie doesn't really make much sense. And And I think, I know that Ridley Scott has come out and said, oh no, he's a replicant. But the whole point of the the end of that movie is i mean if he is a replicant and knows he's a replicant and then in blade runner 2049 the fact that they can procreate or whatever i mean i i just like the fact that it's about it's about a man who's lost his humanity yeah and 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 he's lost everything his ex-wife he has no he has no soul rick deckard has no soul in blade runner and going through the experience of of hunting down people that des that they themselves have more of a soul in them than yeah. he does, even though they're artificial people, the replicants that were manufactured, they have more of a soul than this guy does. That speech that Roy Batty says about tears in the rain, ugh, you need a tissue when you're done hearing yeah. it because it's it's beautiful. And Rucker Howard wrote the majority of it. Yeah. And and I've always thought that the idea that Rick Deckard is a replicant is an odd idea. It's something you come up with like your late night in your you're talking about philosophy in your college dorm room and someone says, What if what if Rick Deckard's a replicant, man? Because it doesn't to me, that's what that movie is all about. It's about a soulless man yeah. hunting down false men that have souls. Yeah. And and that's why that movie I think means so much. That it, it, in our technologically advanced society, even high technology has something to offer to the human soul. The, that um, that movie spawned, I guess, everybody referring to cyberpunk and that whole. Oh, yeah. uh, um, you have Johnny Mnemonic. You have um, you know well, Neur- Neuromancer. You know Neuromancer came out two years after that. William Gibson's Neuromancer. That was like the dawn of modern cyberpunk. And you have all those. All those films are all influenced by. Uh, and I actually remember hearing that. Uh, that uh, Philip Dick, before he died, got to see just a little bit of the uh, Hades, the opening stuff with the Hades and the eye and the explosions at the beginning. And he goes, how did you read my mind? How did you know that was was, it was in my mind? And he heard the Vangelis music and stuff. Um, that movie is is a work of art. Uh, it, it's so good. I'm, I'm surprised that uh, uh, Villeneuve w- was able to do in his film where he just left it very vague in his, se- yeah. in his sequel, because Ridley Scott produced it, but Ridley Scott thinks he's a replicant, and 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 the director said, "No, he's not." Yeah, yeah, I, I think that they, yeah, it's pretty cool that he did. I really like Blade Runner twenty forty nine. It's really good. Oh. It's really good. Um, in your career, of all the things you've got to uh, do, projects you've got to work on, people you've got to meet. Um, you've, you've got to check off like bucket list stuff. It's like, you got to, you got to work on st- uh, stuff, uh, that is related to Star Trek and you grew up watching Star Trek. What is, what's something you have yet to do that actually is something that once you do that, they could just put you in the box because you're like, I could die happy. Uh, you know what? There's a couple more movies I want to make. Um, 
that one's a I, I don't want to say what it is, but it's a book I read in 1987, and I've been working on a script for it. I, it's too expensive. I don't know if I could ever get it made. But you know, with Coppola making Megalopolis, his longtime dream project. But there, there's a couple of things I, I would like to make two or three more movies. Like if I could have four or five movies in my life, I've made one. But if I could have an oeuvre, you know, and and just a couple of movies, I, I would love to make a great horror film, a great sort of a Kubrickian fantasy movie, which is uh, a a movie like Donna Tartt's book, The Secret History, and then maybe a great drama. Um, mostly probably based on books because the things, the, the, the movies that I want to make, there's so many books that I've read that I've wanted to adapt. And when I moved to LA, there was probably like 500 books and now it's down to like a shelf full because so, so many of them have already been adapted. But yeah, I mean, there's, but again, I, it, it's, it's getting harder and harder to do that. And the thing that really bothers me the most, I think, is that movies don't carry the same weight, especially with younger people. Um, movies meant so much to me as a, as a, as a kid and growing up. And I, I really learned about the world and it's funny. There was, there's movies like, I keep talking about this, but I was really taken with movies like Last Year at Marion Bad or or Antonioni's Ennui trilogy, La Note, La Ventura, and The Eclipse. I can't even recommend those movies to most of the people that watch the pundit shows that I'm on. They wouldn't like them. And they wouldn't like them because they didn't grow up in a world where they were trained to be able to watch a like an Italian neorealist movie and get something out of it. Well, because- let, me inter- let, let me interject real quick. The fact that not two years consecutively, but uh, *Parasite* didn't only win in its fe- in its category of it being a foreign movie; it transcended as a best f- picture. And then everything, everywhere, all at once, you know, foreign films or films about um, other you know cultures and stuff actually getting front and center. Um, it actually is inspiring that it happened. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, 48-hour film project. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to have a lot of friends that would do that. Jacksonville, because every you know every year there's going to be a winner in every city. Jacksonville, when it went to Filmapalooza in L.A., it won worldwide this year. Wow. Well, that's a, great a, to hear. I'm from the city that that won, and and I'm sitting there watching the awards, and just because you think something's too good to be true. You don't allow yourself to think that it could happen. And so right. they're getting down to the top three categories. And one of the films was like this really lavish thing that took place in a, a palace that was like an Asian film. And it was so beautiful. And there was other, it was a French movie. There was lots of different wonderful movies. And they got down to the top three. And I was like, okay, well, the third place is this. And the second place is this. And they got down to the last one. I'm like, there's, it would be amazing if Jacksonville beat the world, but there's so many other there's so many other films that were done with lots of production value and stuff like that. But the film that Jacksonville won was a beautiful human story that didn't have to have all the pizzazz and the and all the uh, the big production value. It had heart, right? And the the world rep, uh, recognized heart, and heart beat out budget and production value and won the night and it's it's inspiring no i think that's incredible and and now with all the technology and tools you know coppola once said that he expected one day the next citizen kane was going to be made by some 12 year old girl in a basement or something something to that effect because we have the technology and the tools and i think that's the great the great democratization of filmmaking is because you know we're carrying around supercomputers in our pockets that have 4k cameras in them and you can buy lens packages and you know the 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 impulse to make films i think is still there and it's never been easier to get the technology i just it's the form, you know, like you said, I love seeing, because I love Korean cinema, I love seeing Parasite win Best Picture and Everything Everywhere All at Once as well. Innovative stuff, the Daniels. I mean, I loved uh, um, Swiss Army Man. I couldn't believe they made that. I mean, it was like, wow. And this to see them. But I think w- there's a lot of different kinds of storytelling in cinema. And I think we're now the that 
that when I say those the Antonioni movies I was talking about, the way they tell their story or Tarkovsky's Stalker, you know, most people I know would say it was like paint, watching paint dry. I watched a lot of different forms of storytelling in cinema, and I, I, I would like to see more of that. I think the traditional storytelling forms in cinema have not they have not evolved much. And on one hand, that's fine. But on the other hand, and we're, we're seeing more, more, what I love is we're getting more voices in cinema. We're hearing from a lot of different kinds of people that traditionally oh, yeah. weren't, were not making movies, which I think is fantastic. Uh, on my own show, I always say every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. You have uh, Ava DuVernay. You have um, the guy that made Amelie, Jean Pierre Jean Pierre Genet, Genet, yeah. And then you, you have all these filmmakers that are telling these stories. Um, I mean, he, he, transitioned into making mainstream movies but Guillermo del Toro, David Caron, um, when franchise films give the opportunity to the foreign filmmakers, I actually think foreign filmmakers probably would make American movies almost better than American filmmakers sometimes because they have a lens, they can look at our culture from the outside and be objective and not be sentimental about it maybe. I totally agree with you. Absolutely. But I still look forward to every movie I watch. Oh yeah, uh, I think one of our one of my favorite filmmakers that just keep cranking out amazing stuff is David Fincher. Oh um, yeah, I, I actually like uh, on the box set for uh, the Alien quadrilogy. I actually like when they restored kind of his version of Alien Three. I agree. It, it's and that documentary on the making of it's incredible. Oh yeah, I mean. Uh, those tell-all documentaries are very interesting because when they originally released that documentary on the box set, that one section about how things went to shit was completely cut out of the documentary. And then when they put it out on Blu-ray, yeah, they put they it add- back in. I wonder, is that because of they had to clear certain people of authorizing yep. it and they fi- then they just finally said, oh, the hell with it? No, no, they had to make sure they had to clear it. They that it was the, the the studio was afraid of looking bad, and so yeah, that was my friend Charlie made those documentaries, Charlie Lazarica, and he's an incredible documentarian. And, well, they, did the uh, same, they did the same. They did the same thing with um, the the uh, um, the Andy Kaufman movie that Jim Carrey was in. They the they they finally released all the behind the scenes stuff that that uh, Jim Carrey shot. For that movie, yep. uh, and they wouldn't let him release it at the time. But now there's all this wealth of footage. You know, my time is Andy. You know, yep, it's incredible. It is incredible, and and it, this has been incredible. I I get to working on the show in an agent fashion of being a guest interviewer. I get to interview a lot of these people that uh, I admire. I got to interview the composer Harry Manfredini that actually worked yeah, on Friday the Thirteenth. He's a friend of mine. He's actually scored two of my short films. Wow. And, you know, he's a he's a friend, and he actually elevated my films by giving, you know, the artistry that he's put behind it. And it, it's amazing that the Internet allows for you to reach out and actually communicate with the people, the artists that you admire, and that you can make friendships that it, it can last a very long time. And, it's unbelievable. Uh, it is it is unbelievable, and I'm proud to say uh, that um, I've made a new friend tonight. Oh well, me too, and and thank you for reaching out and asking me to do this. Uh, this has been so much fun, you Absolutely. know. And I'd love to hear more. I mean, maybe I'll have to have you come on my show and talk Absolutely. about you and the, the your two features that you made, because now that I'm kind of I'm 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 going to be on Campy a lot less. I'm going to concentrate on the art of cinema on my channel. So I want to have filmmakers come on and tell me their stories and, and, you know, I want to hear more about how you, your distribution company and, and I, I think that would be great. We should definitely stay in touch. Oh, definitely. Uh, my dad being a filmmaker is the reason I got into it. So I have so many stories about that. My dad works on all my films. Oh, that's amazing. My, my dad's retired and I actually get Hollywood grade experience and time and effort at no cost. Right. Other than other than love, I, yeah, I pay. Totally. I, I, I pay for it with hugs. <laughs> <laughs> that should be the title of your autobiography. I pay for it with hugs. I paid for it with hugs. 
Well, listen, man, I have to get going because I'm going to go. I've got uh, the writer of this week's episode of Star Trek Picard coming on my Picard after show. It has been a pleasure to finally get a chance to do this, sir. And ladies and Royce, gentlemen, Mr. Mr. Ryer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Thank you so much. And uh, hey, watch the Burnett work. <laughs> Live long and prosper, Live sir. Live long and prosper. I will see you later. All right. Catch you later. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been TTFT and with Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Catch you next time. <laughs>